Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the April 4th, 2023 School Board of Alachua County Business Meeting. I'd like to call our meeting to order. If you please stand and join me in the pledge. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, this month is library, school library appreciation month, and we have with us uh, Ms. Patty Duvall, who would like to share a proclamation with us. Good evening, Ms. Duvall. Would you, Ms. Duvall, the light there? Do you see, turn it on, it should have a red light on it that'll come on. There we go, it's on now. Oh, it's on, okay, excellent. You know, I'm a teacher, we don't usually use these things. So. Good evening, Superintendent Andrew, Madam Chair, board members. My name is Patty Duvall, and I am the District Media Specialist for Alachua County Public Schools. I have with me this evening Devin Campbell, one of our amazing media specialists at Wiles Elementary. And I am here to represent the 48 amazing library media specialists that we have in our public schools in Alachua County. The American Association of Libraries designates the month of April as National School Library Month. And I'd like to take this opportunity to read to you the proclamation supporting here the de this designation here in Alachua County Public Schools. Whereas school library programs promote literacy and the enjoyment of reading, and are an important asset in the education of Alachua County's youth, and whereas school library programs significantly contribute to the student achievement by providing instructional support resources and services, and whereas school libraries provide access to information in a variety of formats within the school as well as digital resources outside of the school, and whereas Learning to become effective users of information and ideas is essential in Alachua County's school library programs. Whereas school librarians are instructors and instructional partners and consultants in the teaching and learning process. Now therefore we proclaim that the School Board of Alachua County extends greetings and best wishes to all observing April 2023 as School Library Month. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duvall. And on behalf of the chair and the board, we'd like to extend our thanks to um, all of our certified media specialists. I think I wrote down, you said we had 48, 48 of them in the district. Mm -hmm. And I know that you all have had your challenges and your work cut out for you of late, um, reviewing and cataloging. Um, all of our media materials that's in the library, as well as um, reviewing and, and helping, assisting the classroom teachers in doing that. So we thank you for your work. I'm not sure if anyone else would have something to say to Ms. Duvall um, before she departs from us, but we will take that time right now if you would like to say something to her or the staff that may be listening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you all very much for your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. And I'm not sure if Miss, if, she, if you, she'd like to have something to say, she could as well. Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> all right, um, as customary on the first month of meeting of each month, we allow our Education Association Union to come and give us updates and we will now give them a space to come briefly before us. Chair Certain, board members, um, district staff, and um, Superintendent Andrew. Um, Dr. Tessman, the Vice President Instructional of ACEA and the Service Unit Director, thank you again for having us speak. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to speak for our 2,300 members um, every month. I have two main things to talk about. Um, we know that we're all very concerned about retention of employees. Um, and ACEA is very interested and sees the need for um, 
committees on focusing on the retention of teachers and a separate one or focusing on the retention of ESPs. Um, I know Ms. Ward has, has floated this idea before and we are reiterating um, our the, seeing the need for it. Um, and my second thing I wanna talk about is violence against employees. Um, the contract states that ACEA will be notified of assaults against ESPs and teachers, and ESPs are education support professionals for anybody who's not sure. Um, we are still not receiving all of the notifications that we should be. Um, we know this because when we call to check up on employees, they tell us that this is not the first time they've been assaulted this year. Um, that's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it, it, speaking to the victims that we do, um, they often are kind of like, well, that's just the way it is. And, and we can't have that. Um, students, and this is not every student, we have amazing students and we have students who truly need help, but we cannot allow them to continue to hit, punch, kick, and bite our employees. They are cursing at them and spitting at them and doing all of those things to other students as well. Allowing this behavior to occur in our school shows children it is okay to assault others and it traumatizes the students and employees and leaves the assailant without the help they need to curb their behavior before they are out of school even more than they are and subject to law enforcement. It's our job to help them. We don't want them to deal with law enforcement later on. Our students and employees should work, um, should not work in a repetitively traumatic environment. I am legitimately concerned for the safety of our employees. I hope we don't have anybody yet that has sustained a permanent disability because of this violence, but I feel like we have some people in some situations where that could be a thing, and we, we just can't have that. Um, we have to find a way to stop all violence against students and employees, um, no matter what the reason may be, nothing excuses violence. Thank you, and I'm Carmen Ward. I'm the president of Alachua County Education Association. And um, thank you, board chair, for giving us this time. And I just want to um, thank you, board members, for listening, and Superintendent Andrew and staff. Um, board chair, I just want to congratulate you and um, thank you for the t-shirt you have on because I too stand with moms demand action and we are living in a strange Florida at the moment where restricting guns is seen as a problem and restricting books is um, seen as a solution. And I think that's really concerning um, for all Floridians right now. Um, we in the union are looking at possibly losing our ability to collect um, union dues the way we've done for over 30 years through payroll deduction. And so I do want to say to all of our members out there, we see you, we are still protecting you, and this union will continue to um, exist. And so we are gonna be pivoting to e-dues. We, we have been working on um, getting all of our data cleaned up and accurate so that we can make that change when it comes from um, the bill that is that is gonna be heard next week because there's a really good chance that that union busting bill will pass. And, um, and that's, that is a shame because that union busting bill impacts not only union members in the state of Florida, but 600,000 public employees across our state in all different facets, except for um, the, except for the um, 
the first responders, the police and the firefighters have been carved out of the bill, but all of the doctors, nurses, teachers, bus drivers, food service, electrical workers, everyone in the state of Florida who is covered by a contract is impacted negatively. And so we are definitely fighting against that, but we are ready to pivot to e-dues and we will be doing that. And I just wanna say we appreciate all of our members and it is time to recommit to union um, and being a union because we are gonna need all of us um, in that fight. And um, I just wanna also thank our media specialists and thank this county because I came from a county, I taught in Levy County for 26 years. They had done away with media specialists there. They have no media specialists. They only have media clerks. And this county has made it a priority to have excellent libraries headed by media specialists. And I really um, always encourage that they are able to continue to do their job. Um, the last thing I will say uh, is that we are looking forward to going back to the table. We have a lot of things out there on both sides and um, we are just putting that out there that we are excited and ready to go back. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ward and Dr. Tessman. Um, Superintendent Andrew via Mr. Shellnut. Um, this is the s second time I've heard um, this thrown out that we have not, are not in compliance with notification of the union of instances of violence. So um, I think I followed up on that again. So we'll probably, we'll circle back to you after the meeting, you know, via email for that to ensure that we are in compliance with that because that is something that we, we um, do want to make sure that we are doing. And as far as um, violence against instructional staff or our support staff should not be tolerated. I agree it's serious. Um, it is one of the challenges, not violence, but student misbehavior or poor behavior is a challenge that we've been hearing about all school year, um, and even before this school year. And um, I think Dr. Edwards and her team of behavior professionals in whatever capacity that they are, I'm hoping are, will be looking at our, the, the, the ABC report to for that to, to, to see of those instances and where that is and it happening. And that is, I think, one use of that report so that we can, at, the, at a high level of that, um, be trying to monitor that in addition to what is being done at the school level. It's not something that would be done here at the board level. So thank you with that. Can I now get an, a motion to adopt our agenda? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. So, um, Motion made by Dr. McNeely, second by Dr. Rockwell. Is there any discussion, any uh, modifications to our agenda? Okay. We'll see a none, all in favor? Aye. Those that oppose? Okay, motion passed 5-0, thank you. Thank you. All right. We had um, the um, minutes from March 21st meeting. Is there a motion to approve those? Second. Second. Any discussion or corrections? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Okay. The workshop minutes are not available for approval. Okay. At the time now for board member and superintendent announcements, if you would, when your light is on and I acknowledge you, please turn your light off, if you would. Okay. All right, so I see. Right, so I will start from this time from my left and come right. So, Ms. McGraw, you're acknowledged. All right, thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening to each of you all who are in attendance. Uh, this week, past week, has been a very busy week. Um, was in training, COSBA, at our first annual conference, which is one of the national conferences, and I will say that. Um, we attended some workshops. Uh, safety doesn't happen by accident. 
So I hear you when you talk about uh, violence toward the staff and trying to work with our children and also looking at how we make our schools safe overall. Uh, attended that workshop and also are we preparing our children uh, for the future was a great workshop as well because now when kids are in class we must understand it's a, it's it, we have to look at things now from a global perspective our children are no longer competing with the person right next to them they are competing with somebody who may be out of the country way across so we have got to look at how we're doing so there was some great workshops that we were able uh, to attend and I really enjoyed that and also um, the, little, the week before I was able to attend Alachua Elementary uh, looking at this one of our state improvement schools and so we will continue to work as a board to see how we can make sure we're meeting uh, student outcomes for the better. Thank you Madam Chair. Thank you Ms. McGraw. Dr. Rockwell. You're, you're yes. Thank you. Um, last week I visited Terwilliger Elementary and I want to thank their staff, administration and faculty for having me and welcoming me. Um, I saw some incredible teaching happening and I want to point out that the district has assigned them a full-time instructional coach and I saw two long-term subs and a first year teacher leading very high quality instruction using manipulatives and excellent strategies. And I know that they are only able to do that because they have that support. And I was really impressed with what I'm seeing from people who, who've come in without education training. So that was really encouraging to see the students engaged, um, learning fractions, working together, using manipulatives, it was fantastic. Um, I also want to mention, I also went to the COSBA National Conference and we all attended different sessions so that we could share what we learned. And um, two of the sessions that I attended that stood out, one was on strategic planning, which is a process that we're starting as a district. And I got to hear how four districts in another state handled that process and what it looked like. And I also, attended a session on education equity and talking about the importance of believing in every single student and meeting them where they are and making sure that each child has what they individually need to be successful. And that's something that we strive to do as a district and that we are constantly working hard to improve. So that was an excellent session and I appreciate our district making sure that we're able to attend these important professional development opportunities. Ms. Abbott, you're recognized. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend the superintendent's math challenge at Buholtz a couple of weekends ago. And um, that's always one of my favorite events. And there were 14 elementary schools and seven middle schools that participated in this and most of the schools have a, um, a math Olympiad team that they start at the beginning of the year and they practice throughout the whole year and then this is the event where they're challenge they're competing against other schools and so it was um, it's always it's always I always enjoy walking through and watching they work in teams of four or five and it's very interesting to see these them working on these really hard math problems and they're super hard and working together as a team to solve the problems and um, and just just participating in it, it makes you a winner. Um, but there were schools that actually won the competition and um, I don't have my list with me, but I'll tell you that Williams won a lot and <laughs> Lincoln at the middle school level. And so um, I really enjoyed being a part of that. Thank you. Dr. McNeely, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I attended the national conference as well. And what I enjoyed most about it, I have some sessions that I'm gonna say something about, but seeing almost 2,500 to 3,000 people from all over this nation. Many people from Ohio, I learned a lot of things that they're doing differently. Um, many of their districts have no more than 1,000 or 1,500 children, so that meant our district is pretty large. 
um, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Georgia. I even met a friend that I hadn't seen in 30 plus years from a little town called Weldon, North Carolina. Wow, that was, now that was exciting. Two of the best um, workshops that I attended, one, I'm always looking forward to winning something, so I saw this one, <laughs> the golden ticket, winning the board and superintendent relationship game. Hmm, wow. So that means that I'll be talking at workshops when we are, um, can talk with each other about that, as well as Superintendent Andrew. I can't wait until Thursday. <laughs> and then my other favorite one was, is your district truly preparing your students for what comes next? And that was an interesting one. You may say, what is going to come next? Well, we'll have to talk individually with each of you or share with you during a workshop, but there are many things that our team of employees are already doing, but I just wanted to go to hear what's next. Hmm, interesting. So I thank the, the, um, the man with the money, Ms. Rella. <laughs> for making sure that we got there and we were comfortable. And um, I'll be sharing some other things with you, Ms. Durrell. I had an accident, and I know you won't be picking up that expense. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, and I, uh, Mr. Andrew, I'll go before you, and then we'll, I will close out with your comments, okay, or your announcements as well. So today is April 4th. And it was April 4th, 1968, that this nation lost through assassination, an act of violence, gun violence. Its leader, Dr. Martin Luther King, was assassinated today, 55 years ago. So if you wouldn't join me in a moment of silence to commemorate his, not just his, the, the, the death, but the life that he lived and the change in the advocacy that he stood for. Thank you. And like my colleagues, they came down. Um, we all were at the Consortium of State School Board Associations. Um, it's a, the uh, organization of about 26 state school board associations. So we, and here we're a member of the Florida School Board Association. And so we, this was a time of training and professional development, fellowshipping with um, other school board members. There were some superintendents. There were some treasurers, So, because um, different boards in different states are organized differently. And um, my colleagues have shared what the tracks that they took. I kind of took a track, a governance track, um, the uh, attended sessions that were primarily around governance. And one um, that I attended to, that wasn't on that track was um, superintendent conducting a superintendent search since that's something that we would have to do. But it was a, a, an uplifting time, you know, busy. Um, from the time we got there, it seems like, to the evening time, um, and all, the, all the evenings and sessions ended about 5 o'clock. But, the, you know, you meet people during the day that you can't really have a conversation with. And so in the evenings we had dinner or whatever like that. So it's always a good time to be out and to to listen and to hear um, what other districts are doing, what other members, and I will share one district in, um, I went to a session on governance and what they're doing with um, their ESSA funding and how they're impacting their student body, but they, one thing in particular I really liked is they had um, four mental health clinics in their district in each quadrant of the county, and they were running, like we have um, the Project Smile, I think it's called the Dental Sealants, Program, so they run that out of there as well as mental health appointments. But it actually started with a clinic, like kind of an immunization thing for them to get the students back, the, the young students in, to get them caught up on immunization and things of that nature so they can get them in, um, enrolled. But I was kind of, um, I'm waiting on to get a slide deck of that, and I'll share that with you, Dr. Elwes, you and your team. That may be something that we could look into doing because we don't have time in the school day. 
and it's something that they, they, were, they deployed because they, the need is there, and they, but they just couldn't do it during the school day, but it was, they're using those funds to provide, they have providers at the schools when they have appointments for the children and families, so I thought it was an excellent idea. You know, they're using the, the existing school building and they're bringing the services to the employees, and their, I'm sorry, the students and their families, as well as employee assistance and they're doing. So it was a good week last week. And I um, just want to tell our, my, my colleagues here, I, next week I'll be going to the Florida School Board Insurance Trust meeting, FISBIT as we call it, and just want to, we got a, a letter and I shared that with Mr. Andrew and um, Mr. Rella because I wasn't sure if they sent it to me as the trustee first before they sent it to him. But um, they kind of told us what, about what we can expect to our insurance premium to be about 50% higher for property, property insurance. So like our citizens are dealing with that with their regular homeowners insurance, the district is dealing with it on a level that's a lot, um, that's bigger and, and greater, more significant. So that's an additional financial expense, unplanned financial expense that's likely go not gonna be funded you know, uh, through this current FEFP cycle, I'm sure. So we're looking at probably um, just over a million dollar increase in our property liability insurance for the district, if not more. So I will have more to report to you all. They've warned us next week to be prepared to get our little premium statement so that everybody will be shocked and will be down when we're there next week for the training and the other workshops and things that they'll have. So with that, well, Mr. Andrew, I'll let you um, close, out, close us out with your announcements. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening to everyone. I do want to thank our media specialists for their ongoing service to our students and staff throughout our schools here in the school district. And um, as we wrapped up our music in our, in our schools month last week, uh, we did so in a grand fashion. We had the middle and high school all county honor band concert at GHS last Thursday evening. I want to congratulate our middle and high school students for their incredible performances and just take a moment to recognize all of our incredible band directors and music teachers in our elementary schools and our secondary schools. Uh, they're certainly dedicated to music in our schools and within our community, and it was on display the other night at Gainesville High School because it starts in elementary school, builds up through middle and on into high school, and it was just incredible the pieces that they played. Um, lastly, I'd just like to remind everyone we have a board workshop tomorrow, April 5th. Uh, we'll be focusing on policies and transportation. We also have, that's at 1 p.m. tomorrow, Wednesday, April 5th, and on Thursday, April 6th, we have a board workshop here. All of these workshops are going to be here in the boardroom. That'll be at 1 p.m., and that will focus on attendance zones. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um. Okay, now can, you can, uh, I'll, I'll come right back to you if you will, Dr. McNeely. Um, Mr. Andrew, I noticed that on the agenda, and I didn't catch this during the review, that our, the ABC report is not there, and that is something that I had um, requested that we have at each of the meetings, because I think we should really be centering our work and making sure that we're keeping students at the forefront of that with their achievement and the attendance and the behavior and things of that nature. So, um, I would like to have a short update of that um, on tomorrow so we have the staff appropriate and it, it, not on all the schools, maybe it's short of how the data is being used, how you are using the data if you want to take the time to do that. You know, as superintendent, you tell us um, some, some strategies and things or, or how you're using the data, you know, to lead the district, that would be um, sufficient. But I, I do think the board should get that report tomorrow um, during the workshop. And Dr. McNeely, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm not sure what happened on um, April 1st, the weekend, or leading up to that, but it was the Assistant Principal's Appreciation Week, and I just want to say to all of our Assistant Principals, we care about you, we support you, I'm happy for you, we've made it this far, and I know that you're going to continue on your journey well, what is the word, help me.
Y'all don't know? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Well-grounded, and the leadership is certainly there among all of you. Thank you so much for your service. And thank you for remembering that, Dr. McNeely, because I actually saw that Sabrina was recognized and I forgot that it was assistant and just said it to Ms. Um, Duval before the meeting started that it was assistant principal week. So we do, um, I echo what Dr. McNeely says. We thank all of our assistant principals and the work that they do in supporting our, um, the, their administrator as well as the student body at each of our schools here in the district. At this time here, we allot 15 minutes for citizen input for any agenda item that, I'm sorry, for any topic that's not a regular agenda item. Um, you will have three minutes to address the board if you would, when your name is called from the sheet, if you would go to the podium, state your name, you'll have three minutes to, to speak with us. If you're on the waiting phone call, um, we will, when you come on, if you would please give your name, you'll have three minutes with the board. And if you don't, if you have not completed a sheet, that doesn't mean that you cannot give citizen input. Um, we'll just need you to go after the ones that I have. So I have um, a Klein, K-L-I-E-N. I think it's, is it Nathaniel? Nathaniel Klein? Okay. And... Um, because of what you have here, I'm going to say that um, the board will not, we don't interact with, with citizens when they come for citizen input. And because this topic relates to students and there are privacy rules, I just want, want you to be aware of that, okay, that we won't, res we won't respond anyway, but we definitely will not because of student privacy rules. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to greet you, uh, Superintendent Williams, and you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak, giving me these three minutes. Um, I'm a student in the district. I um, was suspended from Eastside High School um, in the middle of January, January 17th, and I've been out of school since then and re uh, recommended for expulsion. Um, I do hold a deep regret and remorse for the neglect that led to these, um, sorry, the neglect that led to these um, events. And I want to just admit that I had no intent, no plan, and no real idea um, with those items. Um, I did attempt to keep up with my schooling since I've been out. Um, and I do understand the board's and the superintendent's desire for safety, but I genuinely intended no harm. And I understand that you guys will uh, not be interacting with me, but that is all the time that I wish to take up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if we would please not, if we would please not um, applaud doing that. Um, Nick Klein. All right, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, school board members, Superintendent Andrew. Um, my son is Nathaniel Klein. Um, on January 17th, um, he was, during a search of his vehicle, he was found with alcohol and a, and a weapon in his possession. Um, it was deemed as a weapon. It was an airsoft pellet gun, which I realize is a violation of, of the zero tolerance policy of this county. Um, on February 2nd, Kathy Black recommended my son to the Aquin Center. Uh, we received this letter on February 28th. Um, February 6th, um, we requested a hearing via email to the office. The day after we met with the principal, I called uh, Superintendent Andrews' office, never, re never got a reply back. Um, since then, we have waited and waited for a hearing date. Um, my son has been out of school for three months. He's been unable to enroll in eSchool until today. We were finally able to get him in. Um, he's an IB student with a 3.5 GPA. He's been accepted to Iowa State, Michigan State, um, among other schools, um, University of Colorado Boulder. Um, he's looking, he's interested in engineering. He is involved in the community. He has been volunteering for veterans organizations since I've served on the veterans services or um, the veterans board, um, which has been approximately six years. He has helped with veteran stand downs. He has helped with homeless people. He has helped with mental health services. Um, he works a full-time job. He drives from High Springs to Eastside every day to go to school, or at least he did until January 17th. Uh, and he has still not been given any due process other than the recommendation for expulsion. There's been no hearing. 
you finally had an attorney or hired an attorney, and he, um, they scheduled for March 30th, which has now come and passed. He had a medical emergency. Um, we have not been notified in timely manners of things. We have not been given any due process or any communication from the board and the superintendent or the attorney until we hired an attorney ourselves. And then you've communicated with our attorney, a staff attorney has been hired, and now we are looking at a hearing on the 8th or the 7th of April. I would just like to say that I know, I have two other children besides my son in school districts, and I very much care about their safety. And, but I also believe in second chances, and I believe my son, who has never had any other disciplinary record, should have fair due process and a fair hearing, which has been denied him for three months. Thank you for taking my, my comments, and I wish you guys the best. I really do support what you guys do for our, for our schools, and I really think Alachua County is one of the best school districts in this area. That is why we moved here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Um, Natasha Klein. I dare say this is not the order I had envisioned in my head when we were going to do this, but so is the luck of the draw. So my name is Natasha, and I am a social worker here in the community. I very much support the idea of keeping our children safe, and lack of access to guns in schools is very high on my priorities list. My son did, however, go to school with an item in his car. He did not, they did a threat assessment. The threat assessment was that he did not intend harm to anyone and he did not even know the item was in his car at the time. I understand that young people make mistakes. I know we all have. I can think of my own. I'm sure you can too. I'm not sure it's worth him losing his IB diploma and ma making it so he may not get into the colleges that he has really earned because of this. At this point, uh, Nathaniel has, as, a, as earlier stated, done many things in the community. Many of you may recognize him. He was um, at the run for NAMI. He has, is at, goes to the veterans meetings. He goes and volunteers quite frequently. I understand he made a huge mistake, and I completely understand if he deserves discipline or retribution, but is it worth messing up his future? And I ask you to please consider that when you make these decisions. And I understand that the policy is changeable and could help many people succeed in life if we could just look at it from another angle. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Klein. Those are all of the forms that I have for just general citizen input, but I would, um, I'm gonna make the call now if there's, if it's just general citizen input for an, uh, an item that's not an agenda item, we now have a space to do that. Oh, phone calls. Well, please state your name, you have three minutes with the board. Caller, please state your name. You have three minutes with the board. Um, good evening, Chair, certain board members, and Superintendent Andrew. My name is Sylvia Ramirez. Um, I am speaking regarding policy 5772, similar to what the clients were speaking of. It's a policy um, that's a zero policy around weapons. And this policy is really out of sync um, with the school's mission. Your mission is to allow every student to reach their potential. Zero tolerance is a blunt tool that supports the school to prison pipeline, not students. I really hope you look into the case of Nathaniel Klein. It's a perfect example of where this policy can go wrong. The administration is using it to actively keep a star student out of school, a student who's in the second semester of his senior year, um, all because of zero tolerance. 
It's also putting a threat of criminal prosecution on a student who has otherwise been an asset to the community. Zero tolerance has not been shown to make schools safer or to improve school climate. I highly urge you to reconsider this policy and Nathaniel Klein's case as an example of the problems with this policy. I appreciate your time. Next caller. Caller, please state your name. You have three minutes with the board. Thank you. My name is Monique Costantino, and I'm a concerned citizen in Gainesville. I called because uh, originally I had questions, but I was informed that this is just for my input. So um, I just want to say that I recently applied through Kelly to be a substitute teacher for the Alaska County School System. And I was given a, a time for an interview, but then I realized that I didn't want to get shot. And so I, I canceled the interview. Um, my father received his doctorate from the University of Florida in education and was surprised that I could qualify to be a substitute teacher because my degree is in finance. And I wondered what he had spent all his years teaching if it's not needed anymore in the schools. But I'm calling also because I am against all of the recent DeSantis laws. I want to know what books have been banned from Alachua County schools. I want to know what has been the effect of the don't say a law. I want to know is revisionist history now being taught in Alachua County schools? Are teachers facing prosecution? And what is the impact of permitless concealed carry on our uh, Alachua County schools? Um, and I also am concerned about school choice, taking funds away from our public schools. I guess that I will go to a different source for my answers. I probably will talk to somebody at a local newspaper like the Gainesville Sun. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, one more caller and okay. Caller, you have three minutes with the board. Please state your name. Hi, my name is Lauren Cunningwood. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and family friend of the Kleins. Natasha and Nick spoke briefly about their son, Nathaniel. And I just wanted to add my voice as a social worker and person that has had the pleasure of watching Nathaniel grow over the last seven years. Uh, on an individual level, Nathaniel is a kind and intelligent and driven kid. He should be held accountable for his actions, uh, but the level of punishment he's currently receiving is excessive. On a larger scale, I heard some excellent conversations at the beginning of this meeting about school safety and staff safety, and I couldn't help but wonder while I was listening to that if this is how we keep our students safe, is stripping a 17-year-old of the things that he finds meaningful. Um, is this how we provide the wraparound support to keep kids and staff and schools safe? The more engaged children are at their schools, the safer those kids and schools are. And it's when kids become disconnected that larger issues arise. So why was the response to Nathaniel's situation to involuntarily push him out of the very activities and opportunities that keep him connected and engaged in his school? Nathaniel is not a danger to anyone, and he deserves the opportunity to complete his education and move on to the next stage of his life. Thank you. Thank you. We have one citizen that for um, sheet, Ms. Adri, um, Adriana Keene. Uh, I didn't read the form correctly. Sorry about that. It's okay. <clears throat> Hello, good evening. Um, just a couple housekeeping items. Because uh, I feel like we're all stuck in like a really bad groundhog movie where we just keep talking and doing the same thing. So just some things I wanted to touch um, base on. Um, the first one is where does the district stand on a national superintendent search? Uh, I am not saying Superintendent Andrew is doing a poor job. I am just wondering um, 
where do we stand? I feel like the citizens, we deserve to do the proper procedures, have that national search. I believe the Florida School Board Association is an organization that we are to reach out to, and our chair is the president of that. I could be incorrect, but um, that was one thing I was just curious, where do we stand on that? Are we gonna move forward with that? Obviously, later on, we're talking about zoning, and we all know a comprehensive needs to happen. And I just wanna make sure that, it, I, I hope that superintendent, if he wants to apply for the position, he would do it, and we go through those means, but I think we need to push forward and submit that nationwide. Um, the second thing is, is now that Mr. John Gilreath is kind of back in the fold of things, I kind of want to know where him and his company he works for stand on single member districts. It was brought up last, uh, whatever it was, um, and the board voted to adjust the school board boundaries. Um, and at that time, he said, at this moment in time, we would not recommend it. Now that those boundaries have been changed, where do they stand? Is it a recommendation? Is it not a recommendation? Um, I know that's a, a choice the school board members can vote to put a referendum on the next ballot, uh, or we have to take it to the voters and do petitions and whatnot. But I'm just curious, now that we're under that, I think the state is a 10% variance or something, I think he said we're under a 5%, so it seems like we're in a good position. Again, just curious. Um, the last thing is, with all the disorganization, the behavior problems that we keep hearing over and over again, um, I can't remember her name, from the union was a speaking, is the district providing our teachers and staff with alternative um, information on what is out there for them to protect themselves if they're not a part of the union? Um, I know for myself, I have Penn Insurance. Uh, it's Professional Educator Network Networks of Florida. Um, are there other options? I'm not sure. Um, I just have it as a preschool because we have a situation. Um, and is the district providing teachers and staff? I don't know. But it's a continuing thing. Seems like it's a problem. And I don't know if that's something that we should be providing our staff. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. King. All right. We'll proceed forward. Um, Attorney Delaney, I was... Wait just a second. Um, I, I didn't keep up with the 15-minute time limits. Did you do that? I, I did, and we're one minute over. Okay, thank you. So if, if, if there is someone that did, did not come this time, we, we have another a second citizen input. At the front part of the meeting, we do the 15 minutes, but we will have a chance um, at the back end for just general input. And if there's an agenda item that comes up um, and you'd like to speak on that item when I call for citizen input, you may come to the podium and speak at that time if there's someone in the audience that wishes to do that, okay? Um, we're now at the consent agenda, um, Superintendent Andrew. Thank you, Madam Chair. The superintendent recommends that the school board approve the consent agenda as described in items two through six. Is there a motion? Move, Madam Chair. Second. Motion by Dr. McNeely, second by um, Dr. Rockwell. Is there any discussion amongst the bill members? Any? Um, I, I had a question, and I'm, I didn't call uh, Ms. Black, but I did have a question on an item in the bids and things. So, Ms. Waj, you may be able to get this for me, you may be able to answer for me. I'm going to find it here. It is item It's on the bids and purchases. I'm sorry. And I should have put a, a post-it note on it, and I didn't do that. It's for some software. It's something about IEP. I think that may be um, Dr. Edwards. It's, some, it's an, an item for an additional, like, increase in the cost of some item that helps with IEPs or something like that, it said. Yeah, right here. Yeah, Special Communications LLC. It is under, what was that, item three? It's number three. Yes, Chairman, um, certain I might be able to answer some questions about that. So we have... Um, several positions in the ESE department that are difficult to fill and we do contracts for services with special communications to fulfill the services in the IEP and obviously over the last few years we've seen that the amount of purchased services increased as staffing levels decrease because the needs of the students um, hasn't changed so um, my understanding is this is for special communications for interpreter services uh, language service interpretation okay 
Okay. Your mic. So the special accommodations may be something like sign language and the additional interpretation that we have for students with IEPs for BIAC accommodations where we have to contract out services through other providers because we can't fill the positions here. Makes sense. Thank you so much for that. That clarifies that for me. All right. Is there any citizen input on this agenda item, uh, on our consent agenda items that are there? Okay. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, okay. Item passes 5 0. Ms. Wynn is already at the mic at the podium. Good evening, Superintendent Andrew, Chair certain and board members. This is for change order number three, which is the final change order for project SBAC B2102, the Eastside High School Band and Coral Renovations. This change order adds $32,350.61 to the contract, revising the contract total to $407,180.64 and represents an increase in cost for additional unforeseen electrical work, new duct work, rain leader fr uh, framing, additional framing and drywall, corridor above the ceiling code upgrades, and soffit structural changes. These are things that, that EHNS required. This is the final change order for this project. The superintendent recommends that the school board approve additive change order number three in the amount of $32,350.61, revising the contract total to $407,000, I'm sorry, yeah, $407,180.64. This change order adds four consecutive calendar days to the contract time. The new substantial completion date is August 9th of 2022. Thank you, is there a motion? Second. Um, uh, Second. Okay, thank you. So the motion has been made by Ms. McGraw to approve this change order for the EHS band and core room and seconded by Dr. Rockwell. Are there any questions? I just had one. Yes, ma'am. And, and that was when Ms. Wynn said 2022. So that goes back to um, the... It, it probably, she meant probably August of 2023, correct, Ms. Ms. Wynn? That's... Yeah. It's going to be completed this coming August. They're working on it no, now. No, no, no. It was last year before school started. It was last year before school started. Okay, this school year. Okay. Yes, this school year. Okay. okay. So that's a long time to get this last change order. That is a long time to get this change order. So that was something that we had gone back and forth. There were disagreements on the amount with between us and the architect and the, the contractor. So... We, we kind of battled that out a little bit, and then there were some long times in between getting the revised um, paperwork back to us. Woo, okay. Nice. But the good news is, this is paperwork, and the students were moved back into their room uh, frantically right before school started, and so... They, they love their space, and they've been there since the beginning of the year. Okay, and we're paying this last little straggly bill here, huh? Yeah. Okay, thank you for bringing that. And that's that. something we can't do until we have approval of this. We can't pay the contractor this amount until the board approves this amount. Okay, so this work has been completed, and you all have come to this, this last amount on this change order. Okay, mm -hmm. any other questions? Or, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, Ms. Wynn. Yeah. Okay, we now are at our summer packet. Ms. Wise? Yes, thank you, Chair Certain. Board members, Superintendent Andrew, I uh, have for you this evening our extended school year programs for this summer. The superintendent recommends approval of the ESY programs as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay. It's a motion by um, Ms. Abbott, second by Ms. McGraw. Is there any discussion? Ms. Abbott, you recognize? Thank you. Um, I wrote today with questions that you guys answered, and I appreciate that very much. And I think 
this is an amazing summer school packet. And I think that um, more so than in past years, it reaches a lot of kids. And I think that's awesome. And my concern, as always, is that um, I think there are a lot more programs being offered, and so I'm worried about teachers filling those spots. And I'm particularly worried about students that are, all these students we're serving are struggling students. And so I want them to ensure that they have, um, you know, qualified teachers in there. And so I, Mr. Andrew had said that principals choose the staff. And so I'm hoping that with all the money that's being spent on this, that that we will have staff in there that are able to reach those struggling students. And I also, transportation is another question I asked about. And I want to make sure that we're serving our district schools first before we branch out into the other off campus like UF or Freedom School or any of those. And that's all. Okay, uh, Ms. Hatton, would you please turn your light off? Uh, yes, um, you're recognized, Ms. McGraw. I do have one question. Um, I do too appreciate summer as well, but when we're looking at who we're going to be um, selecting, I hope that majority of them have a strong reading background because we really want to make sure we see our children improve this summer. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Um, I'm giving them all my questions during um, agenda review, so I won't come back today. But um, I had some of the same concerns you all had. Um, all in favor of approving our extended summer school programs for 22-23 summer? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And I want to back up. I'm sorry. I actually forgot to call for student, um, citizen input. Is there any citizen in the audience who? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So that motion passes 5-0. Thank you. All right, so thank you. We are moving into waiver season. Wait for it on time. Um, we are presenting at this time waivers for our schools for the 23-24 school year. I want to thank Mrs. Wakeley and our friends at the ACEA for working through this process collaboratively with us that allows um, schools through their school improvement planning process in collaboration with their SACs to present waivers to the ACEA and um, Mrs. Wakeley shepherded that for us this year. The first waiver we have for your consideration is for the Aquin Jones Center School and they're requesting a waiver from the traditional six period day to have a seven period day uh, where teachers teach five of seven classes and have two periods to plan so that they have extra time for team collaboration to meet the unique needs of their students. Um, so the superintendent recommends the board approve the waiver request for A. Quinn Jones as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. So moved by Ms. McGraw, second by um, Dr. Rockwell. So um, any discussion? Before? Okay. So I, 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 I don't have a problem with this, but I am going to put this out here because I've been calling for seven periods for a mighty long time for secondary. Yes, ma'am. And I would like for us to entertain that, um, to really seriously pursue um, having seven periods for middle and high school at all of our schools so that the students can have an additional block of time to if they need the remediation and reading a map, but they could also have an elective if they can pursue something of interest to them. Um, and I, I, I really, really would hope that we could, could go towards, move towards doing that. Yes, ma'am. Well, I have another waiver for you later. You're going to like a lot. Um, yeah, so I have a question on, the, on this one also. So is, the periods are shorter? Slightly, yes, ma'am. Slightly shorter to make the seven periods. It's not a longer day. Is that what it is? So it's kind of cost neutral. Is that? The... That's correct. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have? I don't see any other lights. Okay. Any citizen input on this item before we vote? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, my motion passes 5 0. Okay. Good. All right, thank you. The next waiver request I have for you is for Hawthorne Middle High School. This is a waiver to um, allow Hawthorne to offer a four-by-four four block schedule for the next school year. 
Um, they have been doing this for quite some time. The superintendent recommends the board approve the waiver request for Hawthorne Middle High as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Is there a second? Second. A motion by Dr. Rockwell, second by um, Dr. McNeely to approve the 4x4 waiver for Hawthorne Middle Senior High School. Is there any citizen input? We have any phone calls? Okay. Any board discussion or questions? So, Ms. Wise? Yes, ma'am. Are we going to um, look, we looking for art, music, you know, things of that nature at Hawthorne? Absolutely. I've been working with Mrs. Stanford on that. Okay. And something to fill up so that the students are not eight. Correct. Okay. This year, right? For 23, August. 24. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, upcoming year. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, there's no board discussion or questions. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Your next waiver request is for High Springs Community School. This is a... Uh, a waiver that allows uh, early release Wednesday for the middle school teachers on this campus. This is a, our only K-8 school. And so um, this waiver request would allow all of the students to be dismissed at the same time because they share transportation. The superintendent recommends the board approve the waiver request for High Springs Community School as presented. Okay. Is there a second? So moved by Ms. McGraw, second by uh, Ms. Abbott. Is there, um, I see Dr. Rockwell's like, let me call for citizen input and then I'll bring it back to the board. Is there anyone in the audience, citizen input? Okay, I'll bring it back to the board. Dr. Rockwell. So I have a concern with us reducing instructional minutes. I'm not concerned with meeting minimum requirements. I'm concerned with maximizing instructional minutes for all of our students. Um, because that's how we improve academic outcomes. And I'm concerned that we're doing this just for the convenience of transportation and that we should be finding a better way. Um, I grew up in Miami-Dade County and they don't do early release Wednesday for K-5, they do it just for K-2. So every Wednesday, K-2 would get out, or not every Wednesday, it was every day. They did early release every day for K-2, and then 3-5 got out an hour later every day of the week. And somehow they managed to deal with the scheduling and the transportation of having half of the school letting out at a different time than the other half. So I know that it's possible to manage this. I know transportation is, a, is an issue, but I really don't think that cutting students' instructional time is the way to solve that issue. Um, Ms. Abbott, you're recognized. Um, I think we should be adding time to a school day, not taking away from, from a school day, especially at middle school. Thank you. If you would please turn your light off. Um, Dr. McNeely, you're recognized. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a little tad bit confused on, and I don't know, I have to look to Attorney Delaney as far as what I can say and what I cannot say based on some things that we have been discussing uh, in the sunshine. As far as short Wednesdays, I don't, I'm. Are you asking what the effect of the current bargaining um, team's position regarding early release Wednesdays across the yes, whole district? Yes, what sir. Yes, sir. What would be the impact of that on, on this? I'm sorry, what did you say, Mr. Delaney? Update on early... The right, so we have past language, and I want to let you know that Ms. Ward did contact me um, before her executive board approved this waiver and let me know that if, um, through the negotiating process, there was a change to early release Wednesdays, that that would nullify this waiver request for that reason. And so she and her executive board uh, recognized that. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. She's, did I maybe not express um, that? You, you may go to the podium, please. Just wanted to address this. Um, again, I'm Carmen Ward from ACEA. 
We did give an official written um, notice that we will nullify if there is a change to early release Wednesdays. I just wanted to clarify, I didn't just call, it's officially on the waiver approval. Thanks. So um, thank you, Ms. Ward. Dr. McNeil, would you please turn your light off? I, I am, um, Dr. Rockwell actually expressed my sentiments about the maximizing instructional time. I, um, I, that is where I, I want to be for all elementary school. Right now we are, and a lot of times parents ask us, why do we, when we have the hurricane days, why do we have to go to school another day or add uh, minutes to the day? And it's because for, um, at the elementary level, this, we just meet the 900 hours of instructional time. Um, I mean, just barely meet it, so we don't have any room for that. And so um, we really, really, really need for the betterment of our students to have improve our student outcomes. I think the additional time on Wednesday, instructional time, would benefit them. And so I'm reluctantly um, voting for this because I, you know, I, I hear you, Dr. Rockwell, about what, what happened in Miami Day, but just um, I, I haven't wanted to vote for this ever since I've been on the board, but when every time it's come, I have voted because I do understand the challenges of making two runs to that one school for at two different times, and especially now. I mean, now we have some challenges in transportation that we didn't have before. And then just financially being able to um, to do that when the state is not reimbursing 100% of that, we're barely getting 50% of that cost. So, you know, I reluctantly will be supporting this, but I am hoping that our education union will indeed um, accept the the what we have passed about um, eliminating early release Wednesday countywide for elementary students. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Dr. Rockwell. I mean, I would rather see the waiver be for the elementary school half of High Springs Community School. I don't think this is the right waiver. We're taking minutes away from middle schoolers to make busing work when we could add them to elementary. That's. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, are you, I see a citizen, Mr. Klein is raising his hand. So a citizen, you can go to the podium if you would like to address this particular item. So um, in addition to living in High Springs, all three of my children have gone to High Springs Community School and we've dealt with this for the entire time that we've lived there. Um, it, and I must just say that you have to consider how parents are going to negotiate their siblings who go to the same school. Um, I mean, a lot of times my older daughter would come home with my younger daughter and, you know, and, and you know, make sure she's okay on the bus and things like that. So that's another thing to consider when you're having High Springs and specifically released at different times because these families are used to their kids being in kindergarten all the way to eighth grade and then moving on down to Santa Fe. So just something to consider when you do it. I definitely support increasing instruction time for elementary before we reduced it for a middle school, but that's just my parent perspective on that. Thank you, Ms. Fon. Right. So we have the waiver here before us as it stands. All in favor of this? Um, we're voting, I'm sorry. Yeah, all in favor? All, if, if you're in favor, if you would vote. Okay, all opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, I, I you're approved, so you're for it, one, okay. And then opposed is, Nay. okay, so motion fails two, three. Um, so this waiver was not approved by the board, okay. All right, all right so Ms. Wise? All right, thank you. The next waiver is for Mabain Middle School. This is our other seven period day request. Um, teachers in this waiver teach six of seven periods and have a 40 minute lunch. Um, this does allow, as Mrs. Certain was saying, students to have an extra um, elective. And so the superintendent recommends the board approve the waiver request for Mabain Middle School. Is there a motion? It's, it's motion by Dr. McNeil, is there a second? Okay, motion by Dr. Um, sorry, second by Ms. McGraw. Is there any citizen input on the, the waiver from a Bain Middle School? Okay, any callers? Any board discussion? I don't see any lights here. All right, a call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? No, motion passes 5 0. 
All right, thank you, Mrs. Certain. Our final waiver this evening is for the Professional Academy's Magnet at Lofton High School, and this is another four by four block schedule in our high school. The superintendent recommends the board approve the waiver request for the Professional Academy Magnet at Lofton High School as presented. Is there a motion? Second. Motion by uh, Ms. McGraw, second by Dr. Rockwell. Um, is there any citizen input on this waiver for Lofton? Any? Okay. Um, board discussion? Okay, none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion passes 5 0. I want to circle back to High Springs. And um, so with that now, Yes, ma'am. That means our K-5? Would dismiss early on Wednesday, and then the middle school would dismiss at the same time that they dismiss on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. All right. So, Mr. Rella, you're going to have to work up some transportation. we got to figure out how we're going to do that. I'm not saying tonight, but I think there's, you know, that, that challenge of, of, of um, how we're going to, to manage that going forward. I guess I'm trying to figure out. So they transport in the morning, Ms. Wise, with, on the same bus to the students, so they start at the same time? In the morning and the afternoon, they ride the same bus. So from the neighborhoods or the routes, they ride the same bus no matter what grade K through 8 in, at High Springs Community School. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. We got a, got a challenge there to deal with. So all right, then. I think that was the last waiver. Yes, okay. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. I just did want to clarify that options that the board had would be to follow up on Dr. Rockwell's suggestion to bring a waiver that reflects the other. So there's the dual transportation option or there's the a waiver where the elementary students stay longer at High Springs. And, and we're going to have to look into that in terms of um, deadlines and bringing that back to the board. All right. Sounds good. Miss. All righty. Thank you. All right. I'm not sure who's oh, Mr. Andrew's name on that. All right. Sandra. Thank you, Madam Chair. Action item number eight, elementary rezoning. Uh, the superintendent recommends that the school board revisit the elementary school rezoning direction set forth during the school board meeting on February 7th, 2023 and forego elementary school rezoning and commence with district-wide comprehensive K-12 rezoning to be completed and implemented for the 2024-2025 school year. Second. Motion by Ms. McGraw, second by Dr. Rockwell. Um, before we, I'm gonna receive citizen input before the board discuss. Okay, I have several of these forms here. And so we'll probably, all right. Carrie Lagasse, citizen input. Um, and if you would queue up for me, I, I would, Dorothy Thomas and Adriana Keen are the first three speakers on this item. Thank you so much. Um, I have previously commented on this and emailed everyone, so I will try to be brief in my comments tonight. Um, I have listened to the board meetings. I have listened to the workshops. I have listened to the district advisory council. I have listened to the superintendent. I have participated in and listened to the community input session. And what I have heard is overwhelming opposition to this spot rezoning plan as it is currently proposed. This opposition does not appear to me to be a vocal minority, but rather it appears that it is a demonstrable majority of community members, both parents and teachers alike, who have pointed out issues with the timing, issues with the schools that were selected, issues with moving people twice in the same year, and issues with continued disruption in a time of unprecedented disruption for our students who have the most developmental needs at this point in time. What I have not heard are people supporting spot rezoning as this plan is currently written, nor have I heard a counter argument or an explanation justifying why this has to occur now and in this manner. 
This plan is flawed and is pulling resources from focusing on real problems, behavior, my goodness, what I heard from our union representatives is alarming, teacher retention, achievement gaps, as well as transportation, as we just addressed. I sincerely hope that tonight we can end the spot rezoning discussions and that we can start to focus on the true needs of this district. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dorothy Thomas. Um, I am here on behalf of the SWAG board. I also have kids in the district that have gone to Charles and Oakview and GHS. Um, the reason that I came today is I've spoken with several of you individually. Um, first of all, the SWAG neighborhood is not a single neighborhood. It's seven separate neighborhoods. Some of our kids go to Charles, some of our kids go to Hidden Oak, and some of our kids go to Terwilliger. The Terwilliger kids, you know, several years ago were removed from the old Terwilliger to the new Terwilliger. Um, and you guys, when I've spoken with you, you've asked me for input as to what the SWAG families think about this. Um, before I say anything, I want to say I obviously can't represent, you know, 5,000 different families. But what I can tell you is that um, yesterday our board members walked through the neighborhoods and found parents of children who have kids at Terwilliger, because I think the Terwilliger kids would be most impacted by this. Um, and we asked them several questions, and I emailed this input to the board, but I'll say it here as well. Um, we, we talked to 15 different families. Again, I know 15 doesn't represent everybody. Um, the first question we asked them was transportation a challenge at the new location of Terwilliger. Um, that was split almost evenly half and half. Um, some said it was, some said it wasn't. The second question that we asked them, even in light of transportation challenges, um, do you feel like you would like your child to stay or move this current school, this upcoming school year? And the answer was overwhelmingly that they would like to stay. Then we asked them if they would like to be moved as part of a comprehensive zoning plan, and they also said overwhelmingly that they would like to stay. There were three people in both of those questions that said that they would like to be moved, but the, the vast majority said they would like to stay. We did a survey several years ago when we did the last rezoning conversation, if that's what you want to call it. Um, and I will tell you that the SWAG community, just like any other community in the world, wants the same thing for their kids that everybody wants. They want their kids to go to safe, good schools with good teachers who respect them and respect their parents and make them feel welcome and included and empowered. And so I think that the overwhelming sentiment that I have heard, not just this time, but over the years, is that whatever you do, whether there are lots of SWAG parents or that show up at these meetings or they're maybe not as able to come, please think about this thoughtfully and comprehensively and the best outcome for everybody all at once. Just because they're not always the loudest voices in the room does not mean that they don't care or that they're not interested or they don't have opinions. And so my personal opinion, as well as I think the opinion of our community is we would rather wait and see you do this thoughtfully and comprehensively once than try and band-aid it right now and kind of piecemeal it. Um, whatever you do, I hope that you will start the comprehensive discussion now because it's going to take you at least a year, if not longer, to get the input that you need for the, the bigger discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Adriana Keene. Um, Probably going to be my shortest three minutes ever. Uh, mimicking everything that you've heard thus far. Uh, last night a petition went up online just on Facebook to a couple of sites just to see if people agreed or disagreed. And within less than 24 hours being posted at 9, 10 o'clock at night, we almost have 100 families or staff members or whoever they may be that think this is rushed and it needs to go to comprehensive. That's it. Have a good night. Thank you. And Katerba. Good evening, Superintendent, um, Board Chair, Board Members. Thank you. My name is Ann Katerba, and I don't really have a dog in this fight. I don't have kids in school here. Um, however, I do attend a lot of board meetings since 2016, and a lot of them. And this can has been kicked down the road so many times and there are so many different reasons why 
And, you know, I don't know if this spot rezoning is a good idea. I, I guess I'm really confused about why you're stopping it right now. Because, and I'm glad Dorothy Thomas talked because at least there's a snippet of information from the swag communities. Because I was going to say before she talked, there's been really, I don't think we know where the kids are that are going to be the most impacted, where the families are in this discussion. So now we have 15 families, but I thought there was going to be more community engagement with the kids that are actually going to Terwilliger right now and with the parents, and I guess that's coming up. So I'm confused why you don't want to hear from those families directly. Um, it's nice that Dorothy and the SWAG board went and talked to people, but, why, but I don't know if the board has talked to those folks. And I don't know why you wouldn't hear, want to hear from them and make a decision right now rather than wait a few days, but whatever. Um, I do know that when everybody is saying that this seems rushed, I mean, I think when the new board sat in early no in November, the idea was that rezoning was one of your priorities in November, and nothing really happened. And then I think Ms. Certain in February 7th made, you know, like, what are we doing? Can we do something? And the board voted to do something, and now it's April, and it seems rushed. Well, okay, what why didn't anything happen in November? I just don't understand. Well, I do understand it because it's hard, and I know that the comprehensive zoning isn't going to be any easier than this, than the spot rezoning. People are going to be really upset. But I do want this not to be rushed. So my opinion is if you stop now, whatever, you know, I think you should wait a few days, but whatever. Um, to hear from the Terwilliger families better. Um, but if you don't, I mean, if you, if you decide to stop, please start, because this should not be rushed. We should be looking at the impact of the 2003 rezoning with a neighborhood zoning model with magnets. What happened in those years since then? We should be involving a lot of community and listening very hard. There's a lot of hard decisions to be made, but I do know for years we have been kicking this under enrollment um, and over enrollment problem right down the road and been doing almost nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any phone calls? We got one. Okay, we'll take that one and then um, Ms. Ward, you can go and be ready after this call, okay? Caller, please state your name. You have three minutes with the board. Hi, I'm Cherish Monahan. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, listen, I love metaphors and analogies, so stick with me for a second because I promise I'm going to circle back and this will, I'll make sense of this. But I wanted to tell you guys um, a little uh, personal story that relates um, with a with a metaphor. So I rented a house on the northwest side of town. I now just bought up my first house in Newberry, Florida. But when I was on the northwest side of town, when we moved in, we had water all over the floors that were coming up from the floor. We called a plumber. It turns out um, they had to bust open the wall. Um, they said, oh, my gosh, this has been done before. We could cl clearly see that because the tile didn't match. Um, and <laughs> we found the leak, but we also found duct tape. We found that the leak had just been patched up, duct taped, a quick fix. Somewhere along the way, someone thought that was the solution um, for whatever reason. It obviously failed. Um, that's why we ended up in our situation that was very costly and timely. Um, so my point in, in saying that, I'm sure you guys can already kind of grasp what I'm getting at, is that to me, I am in favor of a comprehensive rezoning rather than um, the spot rezoning because I do feel like spot rezoning is like the duct tape I experienced. Um, I feel like it's just, it would fix some things, but not in the long run. And we can write down the pros and cons of what I'm sure you guys can already think, you know, of reasons why this won't work. A lot of people have already brought up such important reasons why this won't work. Um, so I just urge you to, um, I don't think the right word is rushed. I don't think it's rushed because it's a long time coming, but I do think that it should be done correctly. 
And one more bit, I just want to say, um, I really want to advocate for the Newberry um, since that's where we are. I know a lot of kids have, um, you know, issues with um, with uh, not enough space. But the the spreadsheet that we looked at last time, it 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 wasn't necessarily correct. Um, it just wasn't very forthcoming because we're actually 141 percent. I really want everyone listening, um, you know, online as well to understand that because Newberry Elementary and Oakview um, on that spreadsheet that they showed um, are actually need to be combined so that everyone understands. That's, that's, we're actually at 141%. Um, our fifth graders are over at the middle school, which um, as the mayor pointed out, it does present a lot of issues, but um, just uh, we're fast growing over here too. And there's a lot of fast growth in Alachua County in general. Um, thank everyone you, ma'am. Ms. Monaghan, thank for. you for calling. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Ward. Carmen Ward, thank you, Board Chair. Um, I have had only negative calls about spot rezoning. And I just needed to share that because of the conversation. Everyone I speak to wants comprehensive rezoning to be done correctly because they care about the children. And those children that may end up being rezoned twice are a concern to the teachers. The, so everyone I've, I've had contact me wants our district to get it right comprehensively and not, and they think it's too late for next school year to do the rezoning as it needs to be done for all of our schools. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ward. Jen, is it Garrett? Yes. Hi, yes, I'm Jen Garrett. Um, I wanted to add to the comments against the spot rezone. I ask you to think about the hundreds of five-year-old children that you've invited to kindergarten roundup on April 26th. That is several weeks before any spot rezoning decision would be made. And I, I had a kindergartner last year and I can't tell you how much of an impact of that kindergarten roundup had on her. She talked about it all summer. She talked about what, it gave her a lot of comfort over the summer to know what school she was going to, um, talking about the bus, the entire experience. So I really ask you to think about those hundreds of five-year-old kids and um, give them the chance to have kindergarten roundup at the school that they are currently zoned for. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna bring the comp um, discussion back now to the board. I see Ms. Rock, Dr. Rockwell's like, oh. Okay. Um. My name is Holly Kane. I'm the mother of a first grader. I have two other littles at home and I'm expecting my fourth and final addition to my family tomorrow. <laughs> so um, I was at the last community input session that was held at Twilliger. I heard every community member's input and advice and it was clear that there was zero favorable feelings in regards to spot rezoning, but interest, understanding, and support for the comprehensive rezoning. That makes me confused at why the board is still focused on spot rezoning if you ask for community input, then we should take action based on that community, what the community is saying. Otherwise, the purpose of including the community is what? To check a box, to follow some process that seems or feels right. Um, if we look at this from a practical perspective, looking at the current zoning map with the capacity numbers, majority of the schools are over capacity. And the schools that have capacity are so far geographically, how is rezoning going to accomplish any of our goals? We have already seen and heard the burden Twilliger, Twilliger teachers and parents have faced because their children are going to a school so far from their community. Why would we create more of this dynamic? In the time that the original location of Twilliger has been closed, it should have been remodeled and updated so that it could be up and running again, while the current Twilliger could be a brand new school that would accommodate a much larger growth area in our community. I can't say that I have much confidence in the decisions that are being made. It seems as though every decision is based on a wish and a hope according to information that has come from someone somewhere else. Furthermore, 
Why has a new zoning map not already been created to assess the impact that will follow from comprehensive rezoning? Are we throwing arrows in the dark, hoping for a good outcome? Or perhaps are we still seeing how things will shake out? Either way, I would hope the future of our children, educators, and communities doesn't hinge on happenstance, but rather on thorough research and a well thought out plan and perhaps a gentle rollout. How is the community supposed to have confidence in this board's decision making when one minute those affected by spot rezoning won't be affected by comprehensive rezoning and the next that fact is no longer? And now a child could be rezoned twice. As said in the last meeting, our kids have been through the ringer in the recent years with COVID. They have already been overly flexible through that chaos, and it's time to create a flourishing community again with stability. Besides, it seems as much bigger issues are at current than rezoning, like teacher retention, recruitment, the madness of kids thinking they can run schools and are above authority. If we want school capacity problems to be solved, then neighborhoods should be approved on the other side of town, and the latest one near Hawth Hawthorne was not. There's lots of opportunity for improvement besides spot rezoning. So again, I ask, why are we still talking about spot rezoning? Don't we want to be remembered as the board that brought about positive changes that were solid and long lasting and not the board that attempted to rezone the community after 20 plus years. Thank you, Ms. Kane, for your, your, um, for your comment. Can I bring this back now to the board? Um, Dr. Rockwell, you are recognized. Um, I just want to mention that when I was at Terwilliger, I spoke with administration and they have also heard from some of the families that attend Terwilliger. And their concern is the timing that, you know, they've already had to establish their after school care and things like that. And that the schools that are being included in the proposed spot rezone are not ones that are tremendously more accessible by bus. Um, so although I was initially in favor of spot rezoning Terwilliger because the Terwilliger faculty and administration was concerned about the accessibility of the school for their community. It doesn't sound like this plan is going to address that adequately. Um, the other thing, and this is a question for probably Mrs. Wynn. Um, <laughs> so I'll give her a second to get up to the podium where there's a microphone. Because what I want to be, what I want to also be clear about is the, the initial plan that was presented to the board was that students who were spot rezoned would not be rezoned again. And so I just want to clarify, will students potentially who did not move, so, so will neighborhoods potentially be rezoned twice if spot rezoning goes forward? Yes. Okay. That is a potential because of the particular school zones that are being considered in the spot rezoning. It doesn't include Wiles, Archer, or Newberry in particular. Right, so I'm just going to say that I personally cannot, I'm a parent of a third grader who lost a third of her kindergarten year, and I cannot in good conscience support a plan that could move children the same age as my child who went through that twice. Um, Mrs. Abbott, you recognize. Um, I think for a lot of reasons that we need to stop rezoning, spot rezoning tonight and start to work on comprehensive rezoning. Um, I think everything that I've heard, with the exception of Ms. Thomas, when she said she had several people who um, they, they didn't, they were for the rezoning or they didn't really have an opinion, everybody, it's been overwhelming, has said we we, we would prefer to have comprehensive rezoning. Um, this is taking staff time to create maps and all this time that we're spending on this just to have three days or two weeks from now a vote and, um, and we decide not to do it. We've wasted all that time that we could, have been, we could be focusing on real problems that we have. Um, like behavior or teachers in classrooms or what's our plan for next year? What's gonna be different next year 
that's going to make a difference in our schools. And these are really important things that have to be uh, thought about and some resolution brought to them because school, our school, a new school year will be starting in, in four months, four or five months. And so we need to spend our time working on, on these issues. And um, I think that Mr. Andrew has a timeline for the comprehensive rezoning that he's already worked out and he has shared with us. And um, that's where we need to be um, putting time and effort, not only board members, but all the staff that's involved with it all. So thank you. Okay. Dr. McNeil, you recognize. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, and to the citizens who are listening um, from their homes and from the citizens who are here tonight and your proposed um, comprehensive rezoning. I respect every single one of you for the mere reason that you are parents, you are taxpayers, you are citizens, and all of you, all of you, care about children and what happens to them. I am certainly in your mix. I'm a parent. Unfortunately, I have no, no children who are in elementary or middle or high school. I am a long time educator. 38 years, and 14 of them as school principal. This is my 10th year on this board, and I've been through seven or eight superintendents. Just giving you a little background history of where I've been, what I've done, and how it has impacted everything that I think about or would like to do for students in Alachua County school system. If you don't know by now, I am listening to every parent that has actually contacted me, emailed me, sent messages to the board secretary for me. And as I said earlier, I respect you because you are the parents, you are the citizens who care about students just like I do. However, I want to set this straight for all of the citizens, all of the employees, anyone who has verbally said, this is so very rushed. Rushed? When we had a workshop back in November, December, and sent to the superintendent of this magnificent county that we were moving forward with elementary rezoning, not spot, but elementary, and immediately, immediately, the staff that is under the superintendent of this great county started working on that. So it sort of raises some concerns that everyone is saying, oh, we only have a couple of months in order to do spot rezoning when we started out with elementary rezoning. I don't know if any of you are here. Remember that. I pause because I'm so saddened to have served the years that I've served and I've looked in so many faces, just like yours, different staffs, different superintendent. We've had rezoning, spot rezoning, 
some kind of rezoning. And I'm here to tell you that it has not been easy and it has not passed with everyone agreeing that this should be done. Many of the citizens tonight and the callers and the citizens who were at Terwilliger and the citizens who came to this board meeting prior to the first big community meeting are all saying it's too rushed. When I'm speaking right along with the superintendent and I'm speaking right along with the staff who was responsible for pulling all of this together and that is why on Thursday of this week, we're supposed to be back looking at maps. All of the work that this staff has done in attendance and zoning department, I feel for them because immediately when they were told where we were going, the direction that this board gave the superintendent, we are now at a junction of whether we should do spot or whether we should do comprehensive. Wow, I'm here to tell you, and if you are planning on doing comprehensive rezoning, and if that is the vote that should pass, I want you to know that the same folk, many more than you, will be in this very auditorium at every community meeting saying they don't want it, period. When it impacts your child's school, when it impacts your family, property, where you live, you are very comfortable with those things and you would not forever want to disrupt your children's education. I'm here to tell you that if we are doing comprehensive rezoning, think about all your schools in this district, not just the four that we've outlined now. Think about, I heard Archer from Ms. Wynn tonight. We've heard Newberry. I can tell you We've got a Williams, we've got a Rollins, we've got a Metcalf. Just think about how your comprehensive rezoning is going to look when we pull everything in. Some of your children, naturally Newberry, would not be coming to Rollins or to Metcalf or to Norton, Glen Springs. But I'm here to tell you, in order to do a comprehensive rezoning adequately and efficiently, all schools will be massaged. How are you going to accept that then? You're talking about coming to SI schools or Lake Forest? You're coming to a Rollins? Think about it. Think about what you're saying and what you would feel more comfortable with if we do comprehensive. I've heard it all. I'm the oldest, probably chronologically, age-wise, but I'm certainly the oldest school board member. And when I tell you that it does not matter when we did Meadowbrook, when we had to change and do some changes from Idlewild to Metcalf. You were not the parents because it was not in your backyard. But now it is, and it will be. And therefore, I just want you to say to me, as I continue to serve on this board, that you tried to tell us on the 4th of April, please know that the attendance department and zoning department, they have done their part with what they should be doing. Unfortunately, it is me, 
I have four other great colleagues sitting up here. I love them all. But they have their decisions and why they want what they want. The same with me. If you think, one more time, that a comprehensive rezoning is going to be quietly done, especially when you mix up all of the schools in this district, and I'm not talking about Well West, Newberry, and Archer. I'm talking about right here in the midst, Parker, Norton, Williams. Those schools which are under enroll will need to have students, and some of the students will be your students, depending on how the maps will run. No one wants to move a child twice. I'm not that disrespectful, but I can tell you this, it could very much happen whether you do spot or comprehensive. I want you to know that some of the comments that I have read such as kindergarten roundup, that's critical. That's so important. But the kindergarten roundup attendance and zoning, if we moved forward when they started back in December, we know where the children would be attending, but they are not going to say that. The superintendent would have to say that just as he speaks to staff members, we can only say so much. We are not to tell our staff what to do and when to do it, but you can get reports. And so that's how I found out my information as well as talking with Superintendent Andrew. Kindergarten Roundup can be um, certainly done fully if you did spot, if you do comprehensive. The community engagement has not been huge. The meeting we had before tonight and the one we had at Terwilliger, to me that was a handful of people and we were out of there by, I guess, eight o'clock. That's nothing compared to the citizens and parents in this community. And we are talking about a small amount of people that are sharing with this board and this superintendent. I don't agree with comprehensive at this point, but guess what? If the vote is for comprehensive, I would say to the staff through Mr. Andrew, show us the plan because it's already done or almost done. Maybe not almost done. I shouldn't have said that. I saw the chairperson shaking her head out of my peripheral vision. But I'm telling you, that plenty of things and the staff that we have working on this, they are excellent. The historical amount of knowledge that the individuals who were placed to do this work, elementary rezoning and then spot rezoning. I have a lot more to say, but the chairman probably would like for me to be quiet. I'm not. Magnet programs can certainly be re revisited, just as many people want this spot rezoning revisited. Think about it. I still want you to go home tonight, and those of you who are listening, think about your schools, think about the whole Alachua County community and think about the schools that are all under enroll. And those schools will be brought up too with students. 
think about it because I don't think that the community has thought what could happen if my child is sent to Lake Forest. I don't know what's next for our county. I really, really need for you to think about it. Remember what I said about when this started. It did not start this month, and it certainly didn't start in March. We were well on our way with what should have been done with the elementary rezoning because of what we know and where our capacities are limited and where our capacities are under enroll. Community impact is certainly engaging a few people. I think Mrs. Johnson shared with us all of the community input sessions that are still listed on my calendar. I hope to see many of you at all of them, and I would certainly hope to see a lot of faces, not only from west, southwest, northwest, swag, but east. The parents whose children attend the eastern quadrant of this county demand the same respect, the same opportunities as the children who happen to go to Meadowbrook. Charles. I'm missing to, to Williger and Hidden Oak. In fact, Hidden Oak is one of the great schools because I was principal, learning to be a principal for six whole months at Hidden Oak under the famous, famous principal and then shifted over to The school, Irby, had to think about it for six months as principal intern. And then did I have a treat when I was put at Wiles Elementary for eight total weeks while the principal was out on leave. So I've been there, been excited about being with all of you tonight. I respect my colleagues, every single one of them, and their ideas. If you didn't know it by now, I certainly would like to continue with spot rezoning. I've been doing rezoning, 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 and asking for years, since 2012. Think about it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. McNeely. Um, Ms. Abbott, I see your light again. Are you asking to speak again? Is that why you have it on? Go ahead. I think the, the board as a whole wants every school in the district to be a school where every parent wants their child to attend. And I think that with comprehensive rezoning, there will be parental input, community input, um, I don't think it's the, the, the goal of myself, certainly, to uh, uh, to push parents in schools that are under-enrolled uh, unless it's geographically smart. Um, but I feel a, a tad bit um, offended to think that anybody who is in a school that's an SI school um, would feel that um, people would be sent to their school as a punishment. And so, you know, our goal is to get all schools up to where, uh, you know, 
any child would want to attend them, but even though SI schools are struggling, uh, that does not mean they have any less value or that the kids in those schools don't deserve the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to my colleagues, I'll let you all speak. I I'm so sorry, Ms. McGraw, I did not see it. I didn't, go ahead, Ms. McGraw. Go ahead. Uh, I agree with a lot of uh, sentiments of uh, Ms. Abbott and Dr. Rockwell. Um, and as you say, I respect everybody's thoughts, but as I said earlier, um, that if we can get our behavior under control, we can deal with our transportation issues, then get to our um, academics, because that is key, Z zoning wouldn't be an issue. <laughs> and so I made that very clear in my thoughts. Um, comprehensive rezoning, I believe our community supports it. I wanna thank all of the parents who have sent your emails. Um, they were in good conversations that I had, and I do appreciate how this conversation went. I did a little tally while we were out at Terwilliger, and even though only 21 people spoke, the room was full, uh, and it was a good conversation. I think people came, people, it was well thought out, uh, and it's okay to disagree to agree, uh, but you know, at this point, we have to include everybody, and so I think that's why I totally support comprehensive, uh, rezoning because we have the houses on fire, you know, and we can't talk about uh, money is not, we were not elected to, to say the excuse all the time about money because there are some things that we have to deal with, uh, especially behavior, because if you don't, it affects your academics. And what I'm seeing as a board member on a regular basis, that is what's being affected. And we want all of our schools to be great. There should be great programs in all of our schools. And I do think that this community, this time, we're in a different place. You're really going to work with us when it comes to comprehensive rezoning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. McGraw. Um, and much has been said um, and shared. Thank you to the citizens that are in the room, the citizens and parents who emailed us, um, to the board member email address, as well as those who emailed to the rezoning email account that was set up, those who stopped us in the stores and places when we're out. Um, I listened to all of it, um, and, and as, as much as we've had, I don't think we've had enough. And I did um, think that this, the rezoning was, was necessary. And as Dr. McNeely said, we, the board came together in a couple of orientation workshops um, in the fall before they took their seat. Um, we don't have a strategic plan as an organization, and I'm one that's operating, right? Um, and the previous board voted to move forward with establishing a new strategic plan. So there was like, um, that vote was taken, but there was no action taken on that, okay? so. As part of our orientation and us bringing on myself and Dr. McNeely, had, I had served one term. Dr. McNeely, as she said, had been, has been as our longest serving board member, thought that bringing, having the orientation, trying to, um, to get our new members up to speed and to know, and for us to sort of talk about what we thought our priorities were and what the priorities were, or were for the district so that we could give Mr. Andrew um, it was learning for them, but so that we can give him um, some direction as to how, where our mind was and to kind of come to some agreement. We can't vote in workshops and things of that nature, but the superintendent could hear the hearts of the um, board members to, and he knew that this needed to be done. So I want to um, say that what seems to be rushed now wasn't rushed. It was something that was put out there, it needed to be done. And what I have learned as, um, since I've been elected, and I don't know it all, I am, I, there is so much that I need to learn, and there is so much that I have learned since I, I became elected, I took my seat. But what I will say is, there are a lot of plates that are up in the air, and the district has 4,000 employees because there are a lot of things that need to get done right at 4,000 employees and everybody doesn't do the same thing. There are different jobs and responsibilities and I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence up here because we, my colleagues, they, they, they're some, some brilliant women and all of us have um, 
things that we're good at and that we could learn, but I'm just going to share just for me. I, I sat and I listened, and I, I'm not disrespectful or dismissive of, of our citizens who input. But when we come as board members, governance is what we're tasked with, and there are some key areas and, and some decisions that need to be made, and they're not easy decisions. They're hard decisions, hard in the sense of they're not going to be popular, and we aren't going to please everybody. So to my colleagues, I'm just going to advise y'all that, that right now. I think y'all probably know that, but it's just worth saying. You know, Ms. Ms. Green, get ready to do the, do the minutes. She'll know. Hope, she, hope she'll put that in. I said that. There are hard decisions that have to be made, and there's not going to be 100% consensus on what needs to get done. And then we're tasked with, in addition to governance, is financial oversight of the district. And for a number of years, uh, this organization, before I took my seat... Has, was able to make some decisions that weren't always um, the most um, financially efficient, but we had excess funds and you had the, the space to be able to operate inefficiently. And we're at a place where we can't do that at this point right now. So if you want to have a district that we're on, that the five of us are in control of, we have to make some, some choices. And unfortunately, or fortunately, one of the things that we have to look at is um, ensuring that we are operating school buildings efficiently and our operations are efficient and that we, we're not overstaffing all things of that nature. And so that is the reason why um, school rezoning, that's one of the reasons why it, it should be pursued. Um, the time, and again, will never be good. It's not going to be easy. No, everybody's not going to be happy. People are going to, there is going to entail some change. Change is hard. Change is unpleasant, but it is indeed necessary. And I don't know how it's going to look. The, if, if we draw maps and we bring them to, folk, to the first meeting, folks will say you acted and you didn't get community input. So if we wait to get feedback from folks and we hear from people and we bring some, um, and then we bring a map, then it seems like we're, we're, this is haphazard. So it's really the chicken and the egg type situation. But there were a couple of things that came, were said that I really just want to let folks know that we are here and someone said that neighborhoods are being built. The school board does not have an impact on land use and, and zoning issues. The municipalities have planning and zoning and our Board of County Commission and the school board has a seat there, but we don't have a vote on those. Those plans come through developmental review and then they come to a person who, a, organiz, a business who does our school concurrency review. But per Florida statute, school concurrency cannot stop development. So we can't stop building in the West and say build it in the East. If we had a magic wand, the citizens in the East Gaines would probably would like that, but that's not something that this body can do. We don't have any control of that. But my, um, in bringing that forth and it needing to happen and it, the urgency of it needing to be done um, was for me looking out of, uh, for our financial um, oper efficiency operations as well as the, the conversations I've had with the folks at um, parents and parents from Terwilliger, and they're not all of them, was, was um, transportation is a challenge. And when I visited the school that when you were out with your surgery, I heard something totally different, that transportation was a challenge for those parents and that they needed to be there. But we can't solve all transportation problems and we can't put people in schools where RTS is gonna serve everybody. So I won't just put that in so we don't make sure that we hang our hat there. Um, behavior um, to my colleague McGraw and, and, and has been said by um, a colleague, I think, um, Abbott, is indeed, um, I think, dire, and it's not something that just our district is dealing with as statewide, and that doesn't mean that we don't do anything with it. But I think, as I said, and when you shared in the workshop, the, your, the plan that you call it enough is enough, or your, that idea, I ask, and Mr. Andrew would direct the staff, because I don't think we should overlook that. I do think it is crucial. And, but at the same time, um, I, I will say opening a new school building, I don't think that's in the financial wheelhouse of the organization to be able to sustain it. And I had asked if that Dr. L was a Ms., um, you know, Superintendent Andrew and his staff that they figure out how they can incorporate those positives, the things that you were saying that was needed, the mental health support, 
the behavior supports, the CTE, the wraparound services, so that we can build up what the alternative school setting that we already have in Aquin Jones, since it is not at capacity. And um, finally, our transportation issues that we have. So um, the motion that is on the floor is that we stop what we're doing now and then we begin to work on comprehensive. And then I heard a citizen say that it, why are we stopping now before a map comes forward and before we do true community engagement. Um, we had a citizen, Ms. Thomas, who did a survey and, and brought that to us. And my concern with the last time we were looking to do spot rezoning, so when we rebuilt, we built I, which we re put, moved to Williga there, we had to do a spot rezoning then. We didn't do a comprehensive, they didn't want to do a comprehensive rezoning, they were trying to do a spot rezoning then, and then it said, oh, we don't have the money to operate a new school site, but we hadn't done any community engagement with that school community, with Tooele, and I didn't think it was fair to them to split them up between three or four schools without going and hearing what they said. They weren't the loudest voices in the room, they weren't in the room. And so myself and Ms. Thomas, and I think one other person from that SWAG community walked. We went out and we walked one day, um, with a little survey to try to hear from those families to see how this would impact them. And they had an event, myself and Dr. McNeely were out there and we tried to talk to those residents. So community engagement, I'm not the one to, to skip over that. That was part of the reason why, um, one reason why I ran, because I do think we have to hear from the community. But at the same time, I do understand that as an elected official decision that we make won't please everyone. We have to try to make the best decision to maintain the integrity of the district that we can serve all of our students in a manner um, that is with a high quality, to deliver high quality education to them. So um, when folks say that spot isn't the way to go, we did a spot rezoning last spring. When we rebuilt Idlewild and, and opened that school up, it was going to be over capacity and we had already rebuilt Metcalf which had a lot of capacity, and so we did just consider just those two schools and neighborhoods to get those students there. So I'm saying all that to say is this particular motion that was made back on February 7th to formulate, direct Mr. Andrew, because I didn't feel like he was, that there were, I did, not that I didn't feel like it, there was no work being done on rezoning at that time so that we could try to get that going. That is the reason why that action was taken, and that's not out of the ordinary. So. With that, I'm going to do a roll call vote on this. Um, we have here the motion says that the. Um, sorry, I already, I've already done citizen input, Ms. Johnson. Yes, I did it. That's okay. Um, the motion on the floor is the superintendent recommends that the board revisit the elementary school rezoning direction set forth during the school board meeting on February 7th, 2023, and forego elementary school rezoning and commence a district-wide comprehensive K-12 rezoning to be completed and implemented in the 24-25 um, school year. Um, so that is the motion that is here on the floor. And before I conclude my comments, I think uh, we add to this motion that um, we get, the board will receive updates and artifacts or evidence to the effect that work is being done on this at each board meeting. So we don't wait and then we're out two, three months or whatever and say we don't have time to get this done. So with that, I'm gonna do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. McGraw? Aye. Um, Ms. Dr. Rockwell? Aye. Ms. Abbott? Dr. McNeely? No. And myself, no. So that motion passes three to two. Um, so we will um, we'll, we'll not do spot rezoning and the comprehensive rezoning will be pursued um, for the 24th, 25th, 25th school year. Buckle up, Elijah County, buckle up. Thank you. Um, Mr. Delaney, and I, ha I may, I'm gonna go ahead and hand these out now. Okay, and would you take? Dr. McNeely. Uh, uh, would you, whoever has the one that has holes punched in it, if yours has holes punched in it, would you give it back to me? Oh, no, you don't. And Mr. Andrew, here is one for him. I have one. Do you have one, Mr. Um, Delaney? Did we get you one? You don't have one? Okay. I've got one, but not one. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Delaney. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
The board has a policy regarding the evaluation of the superintendent. It's policy 1040. And the policy lays out that the board shall annually evaluate the performance of the superintendent. Uh, the policy also tasks the board attorney with uh, reminding the board, nudging them along uh, to make sure that that annual evaluation is done. So that's really why I'm talking to the board tonight. Um, the policy builds in some flexibility for the board. It doesn't define what annually means. Uh, that could be a calendar year. It could be a school fiscal year that runs July 1 to June 30. Um, could be a school year. Uh, I do note that we are coming up almost on the one year anniversary of Superintendent Andrew being um, the superintendent of the district. So I thought whatever measure the board wants to take, it's probably time to start the conversation um, regarding his evaluation. So um, really what I was looking for for direction from the board tonight and the suggestion I would make to the board is that we put on a future agenda in the near future, um, the evaluation of the superintendent uh, in the meantime, I would recommend that the board take a look at policy 1040. Uh, I think uh, Chairman Certain has passed around some formats uh, from other counties about how they go about uh, doing the superintendent's evaluation. Uh, that's something that I provided to, I believe, Ms. Green in the past. We did a pretty deep dive uh, around the state to collect uh, evaluation formats, and I think we can make that available to any board members who are interested in that. So um, board needs to do an annual evaluation of the superintendent. You've got some flexibility on the exact timing of that. Now would probably be a good time to go ahead and put that on a future uh, agenda in the near future so the board and the superintendent can jointly determine the method by which that evaluation should occur, and that's language from the policy as well. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Delaney, and to my colleagues, I have the, that binder that was given to us, and much to the chagrin of my husband, I keep so much. I, took, I went through that, and I kind of, I pulled out two from other districts that are in our county, and I pulled these two out. Um, they are, we, there were probably about 20 districts in Florida and a couple out-of-state districts. And these two formats here that I, that I pulled out seem to be the theme across that notebook. <laughs> and so I didn't, I didn't feel like toting the whole thing in because my shoulder was hurting. So I just pulled these two out and made a copy. And um, I was just gonna offer these up that we could see which of these that we wanted to try, you know, and, and we can get Mr. Andrews' um, feedback. Um, um, for this, and when he was appointed, it is unfortunate the chair at that time and the board did not come up with metrics. So it's just been a matter of, because um, at that time it was an interim situation, we didn't know how long we would, would keep him. And we um, have this here so we can figure out a, a, some methodology or way, as Mr. Attorney Delaney just said. But I did bring these two as samples of what other districts have done, the one from Polk County is a little bit longer, um, have some specifics, and there's some where they have goals that are tied to their strategic plan. I didn't pull those out because we don't have a plan and we didn't task him for that. So we're kind of in this, you know, kind of like you say, intestate when you don't have a will, we're kind of in this, this point where we don't have, um, we don't have um, the, the strategic plan where we have goals that we're holding him accountable for. So it's just been kind of a hodgepodge of, of operations. So I see Dr. McNeely's light is on. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'd have to look at Polk County a little bit longer, but I certainly would ask my colleagues to consider um, a self-assessment. I want to see what Mr. Andrew has done in his year-long stay with us. What are the accomplishments? What not just what's planning a planned, but what has taken place, what's been done efficiently and adequately, period. 
right, thank you, Dr. McNeely, um, Ms. McGraw. Yeah, that was the same thing, but I'm looking at the policy, and so a mm -hmm. such met method may include the superintendent's own self analysis of the current status of the district. So I agree with Dr. McNeely. Okay. We'll see that. So we may have to schedule some time for, for that, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so if you turn your light off, Dr. Rockwell. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to say that very briefly looking at these, um, I like the detail um, from Polk County's, but I think perhaps it could be helpful to have a short narrative section, you know, kind of combine the benefits of both. So each section would have a space for notes. That's just my suggestion. We have two main styles. One of them is very um, subjective, just leaves a space for a narrative, and the other one is um, a rubric. So you can have a rubric with narrative space. Thank you, Dr. Rockwell. And you know what I failed to do is we did, we had a, a form that we've used that was kind of a narrative also for, that we've used with past superintendents. I didn't give everyone a copy of that. It was really was my intention to, um, to get that. But like I said, it's, these are our form. This is just a little bit nicer um, layout of what's been used in the past than, than, um, than what we have here. Yes, um, Mr. Andrew. Yes. Your lights, I mean your mic. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple comments. Um, as we evaluate according to policy 1040 to be sure that we're evaluating all of our work uh, because it is part of 1040. I know it mentions the board um, in part of this process uh, and certainly I welcome the opportunity to improve my performance and get feedback. Um, Couple things, but one, you know, it, it um, the board, it says shall include an assessment of the board's own effectiveness in providing direction to the superintendent. So I would request that the school board do that and evaluate the effectiveness of how we're doing things and the processes of the feedback, the direction that the superintendent gets. And I'd also go on to say that. Um, you know, in this self-evaluation, because I do try to reflect every evening when I go home um, on a lot of things, not just work-related, but faith-related. Um, I would also say that it, it calls for um, improving. The board should look at this as a tool to, to improve its own performance as the public body ultimately charged with the educational responsibility of the district. So I think as we all reflect and and evaluate how we can better serve our kids here in Alachua County, our teachers, our staff, our employees, our community at large, the, the, the greater Gainesville area. Um, I think that's one thing we should do. And then I would say uh, with the new board coming on, I think our first meeting together was December 7th, the official business meeting. Um, of course, you know, our new board members were sworn in in November, right? Well, it was during Thanksgiving week as I recollect, uh, and what a wonderful occasion that was, even though it might have interrupted some people's Thanksgiving. Nonetheless, we've been together about four months uh, to the date. Maybe we're off about three days. So in four months and working with three members of the board, three new members, um, that's a short period of time. I'd also offer up that in 2016-17, in the research that I've already done, um, Mrs. Hollinger was our interim superintendent and there wasn't any evaluation done there, but I'm just putting that out there. I also think as an interim, goals are different uh, because from my limited Latin knowledge um, from when I was in school, basically, you know, um, interim, enter is a Latin adverb uh, that means in the meantime, and interim is between, you know, the time between. And I think it's a different charge when you come in as an interim than as a formal superintendent. And um, I think it's still bounced around. The contract that we negotiated was I was superintendent on an interim basis, and I, I recommended those semantics so I'd be um, recognized by state statute as a superintendent of schools. However, I think it's different when you have um, knowing that um, 
you have a superintendent's contract, not a superintendent on an interim basis. There's drastically different aspects of those contracts. So I would just say, in fairness, to consider those things and let's do as we evaluate how we work together, um, the board and the superintendent and the board as a group, that um, we do that collaboratively. And I, I think there's been some discussion, too, of master board training and some things like that. And I would encourage us to uh, do that in an opportunity to, to work better effectively, efficiently, and on behalf of all of our citizens and taxpayers here in Alachua County. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Andrew. So um, it's unfortunate, uh, the, the interim so often, Hollinger, then Simon, then you, and so, yeah. So I think, I guess, the self-evaluation, I, um, I think that is a good tool, I think, for you as well as for us. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how my colleagues feel about the board, we, us doing a self-evaluation of ourselves. I can see, um, Attorney Delaney, I'm not sure if you know of any other boards who have one of those. I can try to, I can reach out myself and, and to um, our association and see if they have something like that they can share with us. And then I can get with, get, um, share that with, with the board, share it with you and then share it with our colleagues. Sure, and it may also be helpful to share with the board the format of the, the evaluation instrument that's been used in Alachua County over the last several years, which does capture that piece, the board's uh, direction and, and its performance. Uh, there is a self-reflective piece built into that because the evaluation instrument that we have used in this county does track the language of the policy. Yeah. And certainly, it's, it's the board's evaluation. It, it could be changed however you want, but if you, that is a starting point, it captures everything that you're required to do under the policy. Okay. so. Thank you, Attorney Doyle. Ms. Green, if you would, um, the, that blank, if you could share that with everyone, with the board um, tomorrow, that would be good. We could see that. And then I guess um, we come, Mr. Andrew, maybe the, we can look to having something, us maybe a bit back on the agenda. We can figure out something that we can discuss it again on the 18th. But um, I'm thinking for sure the first, maybe the first meeting in May, we can try to just have that part of it wrapped up where we can, you know, we will have done our own at the board evaluation and then we can give that to you and um, we can, you know, have our, what, decide on a, on a metric, on, a, on an instrument that we can fill out and we can just try to have it wrapped up by May 2nd, the first meeting in May is what we could do. And um, Dr. McNeely, I see your light and I see Ms. Abbott's light. So is yours on from previously or is it? It's on right now. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, Dr. McNeely, you're recognized. Thank you so much, um, Madam Chair. Um, and to the superintendent, we have um, certainly appreciated all of the work that you have done as interim. I've never called him interim. I've always looked at him as the superintendent and the leader to direct um, staff when the board has recommended and suggested these things should take place. I am asking, and I heard you, Chairman um, Certain, that you said at least by May, please consider everything completed by May. Our staff has, um, needs to have everything. I've asked for certain things from him and he has indicated June, but I would not want us to get deep into summer ESY, and we have not completed um, the evaluation of Mr. Andrew. I think it's critical that um, we have it at least um, before May ends. Uh, thank you, Dr. McNeely. Yeah, my suggestion was to have it wrapped up as well by, by that first meeting in, in May. So we can, um, um, we can revisit that. Yes, Ms. Ms. Abbott, you're recognized. Uh, I may have misunderstood what you were saying, Mr. Andrew, but you said the goals for an interim were different than, did you say that? No, ma'am, I didn't say goals. I said it's a different, um, 
assignment coming in the contract is different. So the contract that I received is different. Because um, my only concern with that is is that we're a struggling district, and so we need to have make sure we're all on the same page with goals. And and at some point, are we going to change from interim? And so you know, because you, you worded your contract in a way, and I understand that, but I'm still confused. Are you interim or are you not? And and if you if you are interim, we need to uh, move forward with with either making you not interim or doing a search. Uh, for a superintendent, because I believe as we do a strategic plan and we're moving forward with that, we need to make sure that 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 you know our superintendent's in place for long term. So, all right, That's, I can see that. So, um, if you would turn your light off for me, please. Um, so we, I think we have that. We have the instruments today. Ms. Green will email us the instrument that's being used. Um, that has been used in the past. We can have that for review, and if, if we need to, if we have any questions, we'll be together tomorrow. We can talk about that tomorrow. Um, but we, I've had a couple, you mentioned not in we had citizen input but put about that, and I was actually, as part of my, um, and my request was going to, because I've had this conversation with Andrea Messina this past week when I was at, at in Tampa at COSBA, when, um, the vice president says that their district is starting their search, Osceola. So they've thrown their, their hat in and they're, you know, along with that. And so talk with her about the process, the way the contract is written. Um, you know, it is out there, but we've we got a lot of things that are that are up in that, you know, a lot of things that are going on concurrently. And so was going to ask you guys if you all wanted to uh, consider us talking with Ms. Messina and FSBA about doing our search and us moving forward with that. Um, she can come up and give some, some, you know, some guidance to us on that or if it's we want to look at a different firm or, or what have you, but yes, sir. Mr. Delaney. Just real brief, briefly to remind the rest of the board, the superintendent's contract runs through uh, June 30th of 2024, and in my past experience, what I've seen in the district, um, that search process takes more than six months. Um, so certainly uh, would be appropriate to start considering who the board would want to work with and be prepared um, to, to get that process going. Yeah. And, and the way that contract is written also, if is if we hire somebody, Mr. Andrew would go back to his former position or a position at that same pay grade. That's how that was written in there. So, um, Dr. Rockwell, I think I saw your light first. Um, I was going to basically say the same thing, that I know that we have a contract with Mr. Andrew through the end of next school year. Um, and so we, I was basically just going to ask how long the timeline for doing a search would be so that we make sure that we have started it with enough time. Right, so we're, we're not obligated to keep Mr. Andrew in the superintendent spot until June of 24. What we, like I said, he, he is under contract to be employed. He would have a position with the district, but if we fill it before June, he would go back to his old position. Um, oh, I thought I saw your light, Ms. McGraw. If you turn yours off, Ms. Um, Dr. McNeely. I'm trying to keep these lights straight. I'm not like real here today. This, this cold, this stuff or whatever I got has gotten me a little. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Dr. Maynard. I do apologize. That light was left on. That was left on. Okay. So um, are you all in, we can put that on an agenda in a future agenda as well to have some conversations with Ms. Um, Andrea Messina of the Florida School Board Association about getting our, you know, a start in that process of getting, looking for our. Uh, I think so. We have a relationship with her, but at least we'd like to have a conversation. Okay. All right. And my light is on. Yes, ma'am. I did speak with um, Mrs. Messina while we were at the national meeting, and so I'm in favor of her working with us. Okay. All right. So we are now at, um, so we've got our charge for, with the evaluation, y'all can look over that more. Ms. Green will send us the template that's been used, and we will we will decide which one we'll use. We, if you all could take a look at that and we'll figure out what we can do with Mr. Andrew. In the meantime, we'll work on his self-evaluation and get that to us. Um, 
the, we'd say probably the target of August 18th um, at the latest, Mr. Andrews, so we could try to have our part done as well, you know, to, with, for the board evaluation and trying to. I'm saying, I said August, April, 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 April. I don't know where I get August from. When I said, I did say August. Thank y'all. April, April 18th. And Mr. Andrew mentioned about the master board training, and we don't have that until, I think, May 28th. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make the board aware of that. Yeah. Um, okay. I just saw another light. You just turn your light back on, Ms. Um, and Dr. McNeely, and then Dr. Um, Mr. Andrew's light is on now. Yes, yes, ma'am, Madam Chair, if I may. Um, so I heard you say the 18th of April, and I would respectfully request, I thought we had mentioned May 2nd on working on bringing the evaluations from the board members and myself back to the meeting. Yeah, I wrote May that second. May 1st. Um, so, okay, so normally, okay, all right, so I would like for it to be done by May 2nd, well, would you, I guess you could finish your self-evaluation and get that to staff so they can get it to us um, before the meeting date. That's normally how that goes. We normally get it before the meeting date, and then we kind of massage them, right? So. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for that consideration because, um, and when we come to requests, because I want to re make some requests on starting the comp rezoning and continuing with the work we've already started. So I'll bring that up during superintendent requests. All right. Um, thank you, sir. Dr. Rockwell, you have your light on back on. Yes. Yeah, I just want to clarify at the April 18th meeting, we're going to be deciding on a format. Is that correct for the evaluation? I am, I am hoping that you all can look at this between tonight and tomorrow. Okay, workshop. so we'll be deciding that tomorrow at the workshop. Yeah. And then we'll be coming back with the evaluations done on May 2nd. Um, they've got to be done before May 2nd. Right. So that like they, the, the we, we, at least the week before. And so that would put us April 25th. I just heard someone say April 25th. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Let's turn my mic off. We are back at citizen input. I have one form here, Ms. Jen Garrett. Hi, I'm Jen Garrett. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak again. Um, before I get started, I, I do have some serious concerns about school security, and that's what I want to talk about. But I want to take a chance to brag on some of the incredible teachers that our district has. Uh, Mr. Pettit, that teaches AP Environmental Science, is perhaps one of the best teachers I have ever met. He uh, puts a tremendous amount of time and effort into his lessons and is incredible. Ms. Thurman at Meadowbrook Elementary is extraordinary. Um, we treasure her and are so grateful that she is our child's teacher. I also want to give a shout out to the deans and SROs that are working so hard to keep our children safe at school, particularly Officer Brown at Kanapaha and Officer Anderson at Meadowbrook. Um, I, we have a lot of people on staff and teachers and everyone working to keep children safe. My concern is the facilities and particularly at the high school level, the lack of security being up to standard for um, security in schools today. Um, I have emailed all of you before about this issue, and um, several of you referred me to Doug Pilton, who was hired in October from Orange County Schools to be the head of security for our school system. I think he's wonderful. I loved what he had to say. He did mention um, some ideas for changing the facilities of some of the high schools, the entryways to some of the high schools that I think would be, would go a long way to keep our kids safer. Um, and I know that that takes funding. So I'm asking today, before you spend one more dollar on any other construction project, that you will think about that. Improving our facilities, I know it's expensive, um, but we have to bring these high schools up to the standards for today. Every time we have one of these terrible shootings, it just rings in me of how vulnerable some of our high schools are um, and how they could be safer if, um, if we spent money on those projects. Thank you. Thank you, and I, Ms. Garrett, I agree with you, Chief Pelton is wonderful. He is bringing a lot of good ideas to keep secure our school facilities. Um, Dr. Mc, um, Dr. 
Katerba. Hi, Ann Katerba. Um, thank you for listening to me again. Um, I had like a potpourri of, I, of questions and ideas, so it's not all one theme. Um, one of them, I think we brought up before, but I don't know if there was anything that happened. Um, at ACES in Motion and Kids Count, we currently have two mental health counselors that are serving um, public school children, um, you know, K through high school. And they do, those mental health counselors do come into the schools, um, we're from a variety of schools, and they come in to the schools to work with the kids, and they do a lot of group things at uh, Duval. I just wondered if there is any opportunity for ESSER money to be spent for those counselors. I, we're working with the same kids that you are, so don't really know um, if that's a possibility. Um, another topic, um, Head Start and the fact that Episcopal has the grant, and I don't know how long that's been. Has that been like two years now, maybe, three? <laughs> Um, and I wondered about the working relationship between Episcopal and our school district. We used to have Head Start in-house, and I know that there's other, you know, community, like the Child Center and the SWAG area has Head Start kids. But what is the kind of continuity between the preschools, high-quality preschools, and or Head Start and the school district? How is that transition being uh, managed? Are the students being monitored between one and the other? You know, from I just think it's because they're two different entities now compared to what it used to be. How are we communicating? And is that in the best? Is the communication serving our children in the best way? I don't know the answer. I'm just asking. Um, the other thing, um, you know, we're working pretty intensively with some of our kids um, in Aces in Motion who don't read very well, that are really far behind, and um, they're being tested sort of independently, and they're at grade school levels. Um, and I'm, I'm curious why you've got elementary school Title I and efforts being done there. Why is there no Title I in middle and high schools? And, and I'm pretty naive about all the Title I stuff, but why in the world when we have like 50% or more of our black students that are not that are level one on their standardized testing, why are there no extra Title I money going to middle and high schools? There may be a simple answer, but I know other schools, other districts have support for those. And we have a huge problem with literacy and with math competency. I don't understand why that is. Um, and finally, middle school tennis that our Gainesville Area Community Tennis Association is running, 165 kids in it, eight schools, all but Alachua and um, Hawthorne are represented. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katerba. Um, are we have any phone calls? <clears throat> Two? Okay, let's take those. Caller, please state your name. You have three minutes with the board. Thank you. My name is Denise Sanfilippo, and I am here just for a minute. I was in there earlier, and I'm sorry I didn't wasn't able to speak in person. I'm really calling just for a couple minutes. It probably shouldn't take the whole three. I really want to mention that I am supporting Nathaniel um, Klein, but along with that, I'm hoping that you will do all consider to make changes to the 5772 policy. Um, it kind of reminds me very much of an all or nothing thing, and it doesn't, it doesn't really help towards the individuality of people and the uniqueness of situations. We have to keep our children safe. I was at the Parkland shooting when it happened. Okay, I have experience. I'm a trauma specialist, and I work with this all the time. I've known the clients for nine years, and I've been, I've been a social worker in this community for that same amount of time. And, you know, the other thing that I also do is I have a, a secondary job where I go into the prison system of Florida and do surveys. And one of the things that I find after reading all of their assessments and everything else is a lot of these kids didn't get a second chance and didn't get the resources and didn't get to finish school or have the opportunity to go to college. And I just think that we need to sit back a little bit and have some 
some more rational thought about this, not saying people are irrational about it, but we're scared and we're scared for our children and we just don't want them to die anymore when they go to school. But Daniel isn't that person. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Caller, please state your name. You have three minutes with the board. Hi, my name is Tina Day. And I just wanted to say, I know I wasn't able to call uh, concerning Arizona because I had a two month old and I was trying to feed him. So I was, if I could say this, um, I believe the uh, comprehensive zone is a cold word, uh, not in my neighborhood. Now, if these same people have a trouble of uh, spot zoning, then they're going to have trouble in comprehensive zoning, which includes all the schools. So I just want them to be able to uh, say that the comprehensive zone is not in my neighborhood. I didn't see no one having a problem with Terrigal's. Old Terrigal had to be going to the new Terrigal zone for the no, uh, new Terrigal. Nobody had no problems with that. So when when you're talking about the comprehensive zone and when it includes all the schools, I want to see if these same parents will have uh, come up with a different problem of them sending their kids to Lake Forest Rollins or Metcalf. Now it's easy for them the same school for their kids to get uh, shipped over to the west side. That's you won't you won't have the school board meet pack uh, parents complaining if the east side go over the west side. But let the west side kids come over the east side. That's where the problem is. And um, also, I feel like parents need to be aware of what's going on with all the kids instead of your kids. And what I mean by this is, that I was taking my daughter from the IB program east side and as I was coming back home I got there on Waldo Road and Hawthorne Road and I noticed this this boy had to be about six or seven years old with a backpack just walking alongside the road and everybody passed him but the mom and me say no something not right because I didn't see any parents so I made a U-turn and went into the Walgreens right across the sucker K on the wall during Hunter Road. And I asked the little fella, I said, little fella, where are your parents? He ran for me, crossed over to the road. This is around maybe um, 8 o'clock when school's supposed to be start. I thought he was going to get hit. It scared me half to death. I called the non-emergency number and told them, y'all need to come and check on this boy because I don't see no parents. He went into the sucker K. And I followed him. I crossed over the road in my car. And I'm, I'm not minding my business, but I knew something was wrong. I went into the store, and I asked the clerk. I said, clerk, there's a little boy here, no parents. He was stealing inside the store, putting stuff in his backpack. I told the clerk that I had already called the non-emergency number. They told me there was a B B O L O for this little boy. Who, who walked off campus and they didn't know where he was for me to try to stay there with the little boy until the police come. This boy said his name, his, this boy said he was seven years old. Miss Days, so I'm I sorry to cut you off. Okay. Your, I'm sorry, your time is up. Thank you so much okay. for calling us and for your uh -huh. input. Mark, you didn't make a single. Caller, you have three minutes with the board. Please state your name. Thank you. Good evening. Just when I think certain board members cannot sink to a new low or get more ridiculous, here you go tonight. I've been sitting there, and I'm not there in person tonight, So, but to sit here as parents and listen to a school board member up there talk about how they are for everyone and then dismiss the meetings on the spot rezoning because according to them only a small number only a handful of people not many people are coming to the school board meetings do you understand that many of these parents are first responders do you understand that many of these parents are the volunteer coaches at the kids sports they're at their kids sports games so they may not have the time to come down to downtown gainesville to speak to you about rezoning let me be clear spot rezoning and comprehensive rezoning will not affect my student. So I'm not fighting for my kid. I'm listening to the parents. And to them, it might seem like you might have been trying to sit up there and do it for years. Good for you. Some of these parents, their kids may have just started school. 
they may have just moved into Alachua County. And as soon as you sit up there and you start off with, oh, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to anyone, that right there says you know you're about to be disrespectful. Unbelievable. The way that you sit up there, you put down, you're condescending to parents, you act like they don't know things. They do their full-time job, then they raise their kids, and then they do their research. I've heard some very well-thought-out things at all of these meetings. Unbelievable. To the board members who actually listen to the parents, and they're listening to all of the parents, and that actually care, I want to thank you for the time and the due diligence that each one of you have put into this so that you could do a thoughtful thing. When you sit up there, you care, you hear what the parents say, you just don't pay lip service to it. There are so many of us out here right now that are absolutely disgusted with the way somebody sat up there and talked about parents that are working full-time jobs, raising their kids, making dinners, coaching sports, and caring. The fact that they may not have time to come and sit at every single meeting like some of you do. Some of you, that is your job. That is what you do. That's not what they do. Please pay attention to how you speak regarding parents. It's absolutely ridiculous to hear. Thank you. Is there anyone in the room for citizen input at this time? Okay, thank you. I'll bring it back to the board. Um, now we have board member and superintendent request. Uh, Ms. McGraw, see your light. You're, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to come back again with... Um, the behavior issues in our district are ongoing and they're escalating. Um, and when we, we talked about our strategic visioning, we all had something we chose, and mine it was behavior. Uh, I did that based on talking to staff, talking to the community. Uh, and enough is enough may not be the end all, or the only answer, uh, but it is a solution. And I don't want us to think that the behavior is not a problem. Um, and we can't say, and the data tells us that the policies we have in place are not working. And so I did ask for on April 18th uh, for this issue to be brought to us as an action item. However, um, we have got to address the behavior issues. So that's, you know, Dr. Edwards and her staff, we need to have a workshop on this because every day, I am getting phone calls. I don't know about you, but also, I want you, before we make these decisions, we need to go over to AQUIN. AQUIN was designed for your IEPs and your 504. She's over 100 and some kids right now at that school. And we can say we have a capacity of 181, but when you have certain behaviors, you cannot mix those together. That is a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, that's like the house is on fire, but, you know, I don't have enough money to pay my light bill, so I'm not going to get any water or I'm not going to have water to put the fire out. The thing is, every single day, and when a student is hitting another student and an adult is asking them to stop, and they have continued and continued, and now we have kids getting concussions. We have kids who are going to, when I'm talking to parents, who are afraid to go to the restrooms. Now they're having bladder issues. Our teachers are all threatening to leave. If it's not opening another school, but you can't all put them all in a Quinn because I specialize in this every day. Right now we have enough students who don't have IEPs and who don't have 504s who've been out of school three or four weeks because they've had nowhere to go. And so what we need to do is have Miss Bing and them go over to A. Quinn, visit, because she is over capacity. And so when we talk about, well, there's nothing we can really do. I've looked at other counties. Other counties have student code of conduct. We need to look at that again. They have student code of conduct that are specifically for alternative schools. But you need someplace else for these kids to go. Not that you, and, and you keep them in house because what you want to do we want cheeks in the seats i'm thinking about money you want these students to still be a part of a lot of county but if they don't have anywhere else to go where, where are they going and they still need to be taught but the problem is 
we can't sit here. We must workshop this, have Mr. Brown and them who go to court on a regular basis because we're all assigned commu committees. That is one of my committees. But there is a huge problem. Deans need to have a retreat this summer so everybody's on the same page. You know, we shouldn't have behavior plans. You got a plan. You got a plan. Nothing is consistent. But if you're visiting these schools, this, this needs to be brought in as a workshop. We cannot open school the same same way. And, and, and as a board, we have that power. We don't need anybody else getting involved in Tallahassee about how we handle behavior. But you all, it's a reality. It will happen if we do nothing. We've had someone who had history and history of behavior in fifth through ninth grade is a big challenge for us. And the problem is, but they've never been uh, uh, offered an alternative school. Even with your elementary kids, you have a lot of problems in elementary uh, kid counts. It needs to be mandatory. Right now it's not, but this is a school system. When kids come to school, we say in our handbook that we're allowing kids to come to school to learn. We only get 50 minutes in these classrooms. But right now, with what we're seeing, these kids are not able to come in school and learn. We've got to workshop this. We, what, part of what we're doing, we have to be transparent to this community. But also, our teachers, the administrators, they are suffering. I came up with an idea because that is what we all agreed to do. But you cannot, and it's dangerous, unless you're going to double your staff. But somewhere, we can't make an excuse. Even at this point, I, it, it, to me, it's a desperate situation. Even if you take S amount of money that doesn't end to 2024 to bring some calmness to these schools and pull them and work with them, you got to do something. But you cannot remain in the same state that you're in because every day, if my child got, got hurt, I would be concerned. I'm thinking about their children just like I would think about mine if I'm in the public school system. But every day, we're having fights and not fights. Our SROs are reaching out to us saying, what are you doing? Because now, and you have parents. I'm talking to parents, but we have parents who are coming on school talking about uh, attacking and fighting other people's children. Not acceptable. This is a school district. And we have to also say, even our leaders, we got to work with our leaders, that's training. We got to work with our principals, say, no, you can't come on my campus and do this. They got to step up. But also, we know that there are some children, and that's okay. It's not about color, it's not about race and things like that. It's about the behavior that they're displaying that has to be addressed. If you do not address it, and right now, I'm also concerned, July 1st, we know, I think it's July 1st, permit this is here. You know, we had a middle schooler, they're bringing guns to our schools, and we can't continue to sit here as a board and say, hey, because it's affecting your academics. We want, you know, we got a whole harm this year, this year, but we want to open up our schools with a plan. So at this point, I put a recommendation, it may not be specifically enough as enough, but there needs to be a workshop soon. So before we open up, August 10th, there is a plan on how we're going to be address behavior, all of your deans are on the same page and your administrators and what we're no longer going to tolerate. Because if I send my kid to school, I, I'm looking at both sides. But also there's some of our children that need special attention along with that support of that. We got a parent academy. That's why I say if you pull these kids, you have that parent academy, you have all that support. But we need to do a tour as a board over to Aquin, we need to hear from the district staff, Dr. Edwards and her team, and see what they're dealing with every day and allow parents to come in and speak. But I'm gonna continue until we have a workshop. We, we, we got to have this, and, and as, as a board, we all are working as a team. But we have got to bring this up to address this. If we open up the same way, we're gonna lose even more people because people are tired, they're stressed, we have teachers who've gone to the hospitals for stress, who have heart attacks. You know, they're, you know, they're, they're struggling. And we gotta show them that we're supporting them. And so there are some great things, any enough is enough, uh, with the transition school, because you keep it positive when you're trying to change behavior. But this is a school system. And we can't con continue to allow kids to come to school in our children. They know at 17, they have up until 17. They know they turn 18, it's a different ball game, and they play the system. But also, we need cheeks in the seat. 
We want to support these children, introduce them to something different, but there's a lot of training that needs to happen with our staff. So I hope this summer we will have a retreat with our, with our deans. We'll have a retreat with our administrators. We need our own retreat. But I tell you what, if you don't address this behavior, somebody else would address it for us. We don't need that. We have a great, as you said the other day, I mean earlier today, Madam Chair, all of us are great in our own way. But this needs to be workshop soon. So whatever you want to put, I don't care what you call it, on August 18th, but this has to be addressed. I attended that workshop. Safety doesn't happen by accident. Mr. Pell said we need to walk every campus, see what we need to do different because we're in a different time. We may have to be wanding because we, we have kids who are coming on campus with weapons, may go five days before we even know they have something on campus. But it's going to be on this board if something tragic happens and we not have not addressed this issue. So April 18th, uh, I don't know, or we can schedule um, Madam Chair and Superintendent Andrew a workshop that they can come and address. I know the staff has already been working on a plan. Uh, met with them two weeks ago to share. And if you look at the data, and that is what I'm watching, our situations are continuing to go up and up. It's all on social media uh, with these fights, but it's not just the fights. We have kids who are all off campus, they, they're getting, get, I know when, when they were at PK, if a child came on campus and uh, they seemed to be a li little discombobulated, they had to go to the nurse to check them out. There's a lot of things, substance abuse, you know, kids are being molested. And, and, and unfortunately, we're in a situation now we have to work with the whole family because our parents are young. Some of them have been failed by the same system and that's okay. But we got to address this as a whole because every day we're getting a call and we know if something happened to one of our children personally, how we would feel and how we would be upset. But we can do this, but it has to be addressed. So I'm asking for a workshop in the very near future. Um, the transition school is a great idea, but however we need to tweak it. I just gave a plan with community input from s about 16 to 17 different organizations uh, Dr. Carthorn, who is great, who could address behavior, help us address, address behavior. But this, this has to happen. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time sleeping when every day, even when we're out of town, here's another fight that has broken out and we can't sit back and continue. Yes, we can. We can do something. We need to look at our policies, but the data is showing us that the policies we have in place, they need to be tweaked and we need to look at them. So we're moving forward, my request we got to have a workshop as soon as possible so that we can have a plan that we can vote on. You say have a plan that we can vote on? Yes, together. So, um, how are we going to address all of these children in our schools that you, you got about, if you visit, and I'm, and I'm saying to you all, if you haven't been to these schools to see what is going on, you haven't talked to Miss Bean, because when you're dealing with certain behaviors, you can't mix certain behaviors. And I do this for a living uh, every day. And so we have got to look at what is going on because also you have these kids who think they're in games and different things of that nature. But it's also when you go and talk to the students who are coming to school prepared, they're having anxiety because they just don't know what is going to happen next. Dr. Dr. Rockwell, you're recognized. So we've heard our board chair, Ms. Certain, talk about the difference between governance and operations many times. The board sets policy, the board sets a budget, the superintendent and district staff implement the day-to-day -day operations. That's not the board's job. We've also discussed multiple times that we are in the process of developing a new strategic plan and we don't currently have an operational one. So we met back in the fall and workshopped for Three days we met during publicly noticed workshops and discussed some of our priorities. And some of the priorities that came out of that, one was rezoning and we just voted on a motion to move forward with a comprehensive rezoning to take effect in the 24-25 school year. We've moved on that. One of them was transportation and we're having a workshop tomorrow to get updates on transportation and what's being done to improve that service. 
One of them was academic achievement. And today we voted on an, a comprehensive summer school package, extended school year package to move the academic achievement needle. What we haven't seen a lot of progress on, and I'm going to echo my colleague, Mrs. McGraw, is the behavior piece. We know that we've allocated funds toward professional development around behavior, but I think that Dr. Edwards and her staff deserve an opportunity to present the plans that they've made. Um, and we do need to have a workshop so that the board can hear what's being done with that money that we've allocated because it's not my job as a board member to create the plans to solve the behavior problem. It's my job as a board member to set policy. So maybe we need to look through our student code of conduct if it's not effective and get recommendations on how to, how to revise that as a board at a workshop so that we can move forward with revising some policies. We've talked a lot about zero tolerance policies tonight. We've heard a lot from community members. So we can do that. And again, we can allocate funds that then district staff, Dr. Edwards and her team and Superintendent Andrew make plans. And so I think that um, we as a board and the community deserve an opportunity to hear those plans, to hear from district staff if there are policy changes that we need to make to support their plans. And so I am going to concur with Mrs. McGraw that we need a workshop in the next month that allow even if we have to schedule an extra one, and I know we have a lot of extra meetings and none of us wanna do that, but I'm willing, so that we can hear those plans and figure out how we can support them through governance and budgeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rockwell. Um, Ms. Abbott, you're recognized. I'm gonna jump on the behavior bandwagon because that solves a lot of problems. Um, it keeps, helps keep bus drivers uh, the retention of bus drivers is important because behavior on buses is out of control also. It helps teachers, but for, for me, and it keeps kids safe, but for me an important thing is that it improves instruction. And so I agree that we need to do have some sort of workshop on that. Um, I have a couple of other requests. Or I know that at the last meeting I asked uh, about letters going home for the parents in the SI schools that have had daily or permanent subs all year, and I know that Mr. Shelnut and Ms. Wise were gonna look into that, and so I'm wondering if you can assure me that those parents know that their kids have not been taught by a certified teacher this year. So uh, we do send out of field letters to parents whose teachers are not certified. We do not send letters for daily substitutes. Um, another one of your questions, I believe last board meeting was around Title I funding, and I wanted to let you know that beginning last year, the regulations changed, I believe, in light of the teacher shortage, and they do provide districts the flexibility to fund um, long-term subs with Title I funding and certainly schools who have long-term subs would not have their uh, funding withheld. We do always try to um, find certified teachers. And I know, and it, and it sounds like we've covered our butts, but I mean, if we were to poll those parents in the classroom, how many of those parents would know? And to me, that's pretty important. Um, and so, I don't know, it, 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 it's, I think it's very concerning that a, a child can go through school the whole year and whether the parent thought to ask, but they may think that a child is not doing well in school and not know that it's because they're not being provided with the proper instruction of a certified teacher. And daily subs in a classroom is unacceptable and I'll say again, we have TSAs in the district and I asked the superintendent to move, the, move TSAs into the SI schools that had permanent subs and daily subs, and it wasn't done. And I think that that is shameful that those kids have sat in a classroom in a school that's already struggling, that the state comes in to monitor, and they're sitting in there with substitute teachers. When we have certified teachers in the district that are doing jobs outside of the classroom, such as being teacher mentors or 
a tech person or, or, or a math specialist or a reading specialist, and those kids are not getting the instruction they deserve. Okay, so that's, I guess I got my answer for that one. Um, I'm also concerned, and I've asked about this before to board meeting, for who responds to parents. And I think it's embarrassing as a district to have parents come forward, and it's not just the people that are here tonight, the family that's here tonight. I get emails saying, you know, I've never, I've written, they never respond to me. And so, you know, am I supposed to be responding to all these parents that write to the board in general, or is there somebody in the office that's responding? Because it's pretty bad when a parent writes, and with all the personnel we have in the district office, there's not one person that can be assigned to respond to parents. And no matter how trivial one might think these requests are or the, uh, the emails that the parents write, they deserve to be responded to. And I think it's embarrassing um, that, that parents are not responded to. Um, and I am, I feel like we've been here, I've been here since November 22nd and at the end of the school year, um, I'm going to look back and think there's very little that has been accomplished. And so I, I am really scared to go into the next school year um, the same way we are now. So, Mr. Andrew, I'm requesting that you give us some sort of uh, plan for what's going to be different for next year. And that includes how we're going to hire teachers, how we're going to retain teachers, what we're going to do about uh, teachers in the schools that are in need of improvement, um, what we're going to do about behavior, how are we going to address transportation, and there are, there are heads of all these departments, and so uh, there are a lot of smart minds in there that can help you come up with the answers for that, but I am requesting that before the end of the school year. Thank you. Dr. McNeely, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have a request, but I want to say something to the little girl who has sat here since six o'clock. You are amazing. And I don't even know your name, but I wanted to say that your panda helped you, I know, <laughs> but it's unbelievable that you could sit all of these hours. Unbelievable. You are great. Nadia, Nadia, you're wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> want to know if we're still having that meeting on Thursday, the rezoning meeting. Um, I don't, I'm going to say I don't think so. I'm looking at my attorney for advice. Well, the motion that the board passed was to begin comprehensive K through 12 rezoning for the 24, 24-25 uh, school year. So uh, I, I did not assume that this was um, a vote to stop the process of preparing for comprehensive K through 12 rezoning. I, I don't think I have the answer to my question. Or maybe I'm, I mean, to that question. So I guess the, the meeting on Thursday is still a go. Is that what you're saying, Mr. Delaney? Certainly, certainly don't mean it's my No, no I'm saying, is that how you're interpreting it? Is that because yes, you were, you were offering I advice? I interpreted it and okay. I think we could probably get a better answer from the superintendent. Okay. Um, that was my request, is that we move forward with the scheduled workshop on Thursday uh, because we have quite a few things still to discuss, direction, and some things that can be shared. Uh, we can look at our population maps as we've done before, be reviewing capacity numbers, and we would uh, prefer that we proceed with that workshop at 1 o'clock. All right, sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Um, May I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. The question is, if we want to hear from parents, why are we having this at 1 o'clock in the afternoon? Well, there's a lot to be done, Dr. McNeely, besides hearing from parents, but that... I'm sorry. Um, that's, that's, Madam Chair, and to the superintendent, it's so unfair to have a meeting that substantial at one o'clock in the day? That's all I have to say. All right, thank you. Um, we, we're scared, it's been noticed already for 1 p.m. And so I know. right now, but 
Um, so I, I respect respect your view. I think um, there was that meeting was scheduled for one, and that there were others that would be scheduled at different times. So every meeting, you know, there are going to be times where there will be early meetings, there will be late meetings, and you won't hit everybody all the time. But um, I, this meeting has been advertised at one. I think it sounds as if the focus would be we will be different um, given tonight's vote, and so. This may be board board meeting board member work that will be. I don't know what the agenda is because I haven't seen it yet. So we'll just have to see what what comes out of the 1 p.m. But there'll be times over the next year that meetings will be had at various different times. Okay, so we'll address that concern of yours of being able to to um, make sure we have times for working parents that they can they can come on. Dr. Rocker. I'm going to be really quick. Um, I just wanted to point out that I mentioned this at the beginning of our meeting, but I was at Terwilliger last week, and um, one of my colleagues stated that Mr. Andrew had not moved any TSAs. A TSA has been put at Terwilliger full time. She is supporting three teachers, one alternately certified beginning teacher, two long-term subs, and possibly more, those were the three I observed. But not only is she supporting them, she's doing their planning for them, she's teaching model lessons. That one TSA is responsible for at least three, possibly more teachers being effective and those children making academic progress. So I think, I think it's really important that we not say that nothing happened because that change was made. And I see a difference in those classrooms from the last time I visited a few months ago. All right, thank you. So um, what the request was for us to have a workshop on behavior. And so what I was going to suggest, given in light of what we had there, that won't work. So I'll work, get a date. And we try to figure out, um, I, I, have, I have an agenda for them to come because although the idea you gave was a good idea, the implementation won't be by the five of Right. So so that so that's I guess that's what I'm trying to get. Like we have to make sure our staff is gonna come and that they will that's you know. We, know we know as board members but what we did is part of our strategic plan, vision. No, no, I'm I'm not I don't wanna rehash that because the time is well spent, but I do long spent, but I will um float some dates for us to get something but so we can have a targeted um a targeted time of discussion with staff about what they're doing and what they're planning to do um, going forward. So I will I'll put some dates out there to see what we can get um, on the calendar to, with um, Superintendent Andrew and the staff for that. So I'll, I'll work with Matt. I won't do it tonight. I was going to, I took my calendar out. And I don't have a request. Ms. Abbott has um, voiced a request of mine that I've had with every superintendent that, that since I've been on the board every year about this time, I'm always saying, well, we're going to do different because. Um, the, to open up and, and walk the pony around the, the, the market the same way you walked in the year before will yield you the same results that you got before. And so I've had voiced that to, to uh, Mr. Andrew, Dr. Simon, Ms. Clark. I've even voiced it to Ms. Jones on occasion or two. What we're doing different. So I'm looking forward to going forward. So if there's nothing else, uh, motion to adjourn. We, uh, thank you. Meetings adjourn. Thank you all. See you tomorrow at 1 p.m.